Okay, Kevin, go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks, Barb. I'd like to call the January 25th, 2021 meeting of the Town of Missy Unit Planning Board and Zoning Commission to order. Mr. Henry, would you please call the roll? Mr. LaFlam. Present. Mr. Scrabby Tennis. Here. Mr. Khan. Here. Mr. McPartland. Here. Mr. Darpino. Here. Mr. Oster. Here. Ms. Shenfield. Here. Ms. Gold. What is it? Chairman Walsh. Here. Okay, we got everybody. And uh, next we have the approval of the minutes from the December 14th, 2020 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, Mr. Chairman. A motion made by Mr. Oster for approval. Do I have a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Okay, seconded by Mr. Scribby Tennis. Any discussion, comments, changes on the minutes as presented? I have none. Anybody? Okay, hearing no changes or corrections. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the minutes from the uh, December 14th meeting signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, hearing none, none opposed, the uh, minutes from the December 14th, 2020 meeting are approved. We have no public hearings uh, tonight, so we'll move the privilege of the floor. And as usual, anyone wishing to be heard, we'll, um, we'll be, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Robertson, and she's got some uh, uh, letters to read and possibly somebody online. I'll let her coordinate that. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I'm just going to do them in order that I received them. Um. I've got three letters to read, and then I did see that Mr. Barack was able to um, hop on board, so so I'll call out his name, and then we can just make sure there's nobody else on the line. So this letter is from Miss Georgiana Carney. She says, my name is Georgiana Carney, and I have lived at 1465 Via Del Mar for the last 31 years. The following is what I heard when I listened online to the last planning board meeting on the subject of the broken inn. Please confirm that I heard correctly and see my corresponding questions. Buildings were built in 1940s and the town code came into effect in 1971. There will be a deficit of 12 parking spaces, but the board isn't concerned as the non-conforming park parking issue is grandfathered in. Laura thinks they should encourage the town to continue the non-conformity. Members of the planning board ask whose problem is this, the zoning board or the town board? My question, are you looking to pass the buck? Isn't this something you should address directly rather than push aside? Mr. Nicky of the Broken Inn pointed out that there are about 900 residents in Old Niskuna, residences in Old Niskuna. My question, since a large number of those 900 residents is, were also built in the 30s and 40s, does that mean we are grandfathered in and no longer need to follow any town code? Mr. Walsh's thoughts, Shop shopping complex is pre-existing non-conforming. Parking is marginal and adequate, which is a result of the design of the complex built in the 1940s. Parking will get worse before it gets better based on county proposed configuration. Ultimately, parking will decrease. Some opportunity for extra parking in the future, possibly to do something on Crescent Road. My question, if this is unfunded, why is it part of the discussion? Why should the residents of Crescent and Clifton Park Roads have to accommodate parking in front of their homes? It doesn't seem you are worried about them. It would appear that you're only concerned about Mr. Nicky. Miss, Mrs. King has offered her residential property across the street as something that could be converted into parking for the future again. This is unfunded. My question, does it matter that she has tried three times before to use her residentially zoned property for commercial purposes? The neighbors on the south side of Knott Street have made themselves clear they do not want any more commercialization pushed into the neighborhood. I couldn't help but notice that members of the board remained mute when this was discussed, even though the planning board and its alternates have previously voted against this use of the property. Will the town of Niskuna reimburse me for the reduction of value of my adjacent home and the loss of my yard if you change the zoning of Miss King's property and turn it into a parking lot? Will you reimburse my neighbors for the loss of value of their homes when our neighborhood begins to function as a commercial area with cars parked on the street? There are other empty stores, currently two, which will further exacerbate the parking issues if they were to be rented. However, the planning board would not be able to stop anyone from occupying these based on in inadequate parking if the broken in is approved. 
You asked to see some type of written agreement on shared parking among the business owners. My question, you have been asking for this since the first meeting. It is extremely unlikely that you are going to get a written agreement because it would be a liability exposure for those other business owners and their insurance carriers. How can you move forward without these agreements when Mr. Nicky would not have enough parking? Mr. Walsh thinks that if parking is full, that people will just drive by and not go into the business. My question, have you ever spent time in this neighborhood on a busy holiday or during a co-op event? Both customers and employees will park on the side streets. Not a serious problem because it is for one day. Mr. Diapino sucks. He is comfortable with the parking situation. The, real the reality is that adjacent side streets will see cars parking there. The existing businesses require short-term parking in and out. The broken in will change that and people will be parking considerably longer, approximately 45 to 90 minutes. He asked if maybe Metroplex could help out on Miss King's lot. My question, what exactly are you comfortable with? Creating problems for the adjacent neighbors moving forward without any solutions in place? Mr. Diarpino, you dealt directly with Miss King when you were a co-op board member. You know how the neighbors feel about a commercial use of that property. Are you comfortable paving the way for more grievances? My thoughts and questions in closing. Is it responsible to approve this project when you know it raises concerns and exacerbates problems that need solutions? Why are you looking for ways to get around the rules for one specific business? As the town planner, shouldn't Laura be encouraging the boards to deny this request as it will increase the parking problem that the county will, will be spending millions to help remedy? Is it fair that neighbors will be facing months of construction disruption only to have the town negate any progress? Maybe our town boards, including zoning and planning, should be spending their time trying to preserve the uniqueness of Old Niskayuna instead of trying to, per to push commercialization that doesn't even conform to its own town code. Regarding snow storage, perhaps the town should require businesses to contract either with them or a private contractor to remove the snow from the property. If there isn't enough parking as is, fewer spots remain after snow is merely pushed aside. And finally, when is the town going to stop referring to the small area of commercial property as the town center? It is my understanding that the heart of the community is supposed to be town hall, a place where the community can come together and connect. It troubles me that you think of this small group of businesses where you admit people spend only a few minutes at a time as its heart. Step back and think about that. How sad for Niskiuna. Um, next letter is from Michelle Lansing. Um, on Pete Omar. I don't know if I can adequately express my frustration after listening to the January 11th planning board meeting. I am aghast at the lack of consideration being put forth by the board regarding the parking issue as it relates to the proposed restaurant at 2209 Knot Street. The following are a few key points that I understand to be factual. There is not enough parking for a successful restaurant to be located at this location. I understand that these buildings predate the town code and that this loophole provides a lower number of spots needed, but it does not change the reality that if Mr. Nicky runs a successful business as he confidently believes he will, there will not be enough parking. And to listen to Mr. Welch acknowledge this problem, but then suggest moving forward on a resolution without a solution seems irresponsible. Predating the code should not be used as a pass to move forward. The Metroplex project that is due to begin in the spring was deemed a much needed safety measure by the county and board. Yet here we are moving forward on a project that will increase traffic on those same streets whose residents fought so ardently last year to protect its families from. And as it was pointed out in the recent meeting, the time frame when parking for the restaurant and the other businesses will overlap is when traffic is already at a peak in this area. What is the point of pouring millions into a safety project only to give the green light to yet another traffic problem. As Mr. Nicky pointed out, there are over 900 homes in Old Niskayuna that could potentially become patrons of this business. Let's be honest, the majority of these 900 homes are not going to walk. And even if half of them do, then you will have a lot more pedestrians walking through a thoroughfare that has welcomed increased traffic. You asked Mr. Nicky for a contingency plan and signed parking agreements from the other tenants. Are you prepared to move forward with the resolution if he does not provide both. And even if he does, have you solved the parking problem? Mayor acknowledgement isn't a solution. Nor is telling residents of Villa del Mar and Crescent Ave that the reality is patrons will park on their streets. I'm sorry, but someone's desire to go to dinner 
doesn't override my right to safety and property integrity, no matter how many comments of support are posted on Nextdoor. To say otherwise is irresponsible and disregarding. The law on the corner of Via Del Mar and Knott Street is zoned residential. Although Miss King might like to believe otherwise, hers is a residential lot, and the fact that this space has been used as a de facto parking lot does not make it commercial. On multiple occasions, the neighbors of this community have fought against this becoming a commercially zoned property. Making this a parking lot will only invite more traffic, more noise, and more garbage, a truth I have lived with for 20 years. Old Niskayuna is a residential community. It has been called the heart of Niskayuna. Why would you want to start tearing at this community's fabric? 900 homes versus five commercial buildings. It seems logical that by protecting the residential majority, you will protect the integrity and safety of our community. I couldn't help but note the concern Mr. Walsh had about holding up this project. Mr. Nicky made the commitment to rent this property before there was town approval, and he made the commitment before our parking issues were addressed or resolved. It should be the town's commitment to make sure the safety and concerns of its residents are addressed before embracing one specific project. Thank you, Michelle Lansing, 1468 Via Del Mar. Um, this comment is from Susan Olson. And she writes, my husband and I own, yes, my husband and I own 740 John Paul Court, an adjacent property to 2456 Hilltop. We are voicing our concerns regarding the approval of subdivision leading to the construction of a single family residence. Our backyard, as well as the yard of the property at 744 John Paul Court back up to this lot where the lowest point of the land lies. There is standing water at this location for much of the spring, summer, and autumn months as the soil is hydric and doesn't drain well. Even after several dry weeks, the land is so soft in this area you sink when you walk on it. The side yard at 2456 Hilltop that is under review for subdivision has been highly treed and once purchased in the late summer of 2020, the owner clear cut the yard which has further exacerbated the existing drainage issues occurring in this area, creating a very large pond with the most recent snow thaw and rain events. If this lot is developed with a new home and driveway, the addition of impervious surface area will again add to the water runoff. Because of the soil conditions, it is likely that fill would need to be added to the lot, which will make drainage and water runoff even worse, creating steeper grades around the home and making depressions for water to pool near existing properties. Having seen the sketch and reviewed the previous meeting minutes, there appears to be a drainage pipe across the entire lot leading to hill leading to hilltop to drain. Apparently the previous owner thought it was necessary to incorporate additional drainage for the side yard without any living structures. What will happen with so much new impervious surface area? If this subdivision is approved by the planning board, the lot would need area variances from the board of zoning appeals as it does not meet the setback or size requirements. If this lot is built upon both yards of these houses at 2456 Hilltop will be small and waterlogged, as will the yards at 740 and 744 John Paul Court. I understand the owner purchased the lot with the intention of subdividing, but this was a speculative move. Existing property owner's investment should not be degraded by a speculative development on a substandard lot that doesn't meet the current setback and size requirements and where water runoff and drainage are evidenced and negatively impacting surrounding properties. The owner can still sell the existing home with the side yard intact. We ask that the minor subdivision approval for an additional residential building lot at 2456 Hilltop be denied. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Susan and Tim Olson, 740 John Paul Court, Niskeen in New York, 2309. Um, so those are the three that I have, and I did see that Bruce had joined us. Bruce, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I live at uh, 1020 Shannon Boulevard, and this is in reference to the um, small subdivision that's being contemplated basically across the street from me and my neighbors. Um, uh, Mr. Bicelion, I have now been told recently, is now selling these lots to three other people. So I guess my concern is he had made some commitments to uh, what he planned to do there and uh, things like keeping the houses that were going to be built uh, of the same quality and size, et cetera, as the other houses in the vicinity. 
And I guess my concern is that now this is going to be turned over to three other people. He's going to do the driveways and some of the clearing, but that still doesn't stop the people who purchase these lots from doing whatever they want, uh, subject to the approval of the town. Uh, Laura tells me that there's an architectural board who would have to approve what they did, but uh, I think uh, I think uh, my wife and I, and certainly the other neighbors, uh, would have concerns about just what kind of constraints uh, could be manifest on these people. Uh, clearly, we don't want to see. Uh, homes that are of lesser quality than what we have right across the street uh, go up and thereby devalue our homes and and you know basically hurt the uh, the general appearance of the neighborhood. Okay, so I guess I'd, I'd like to hear something from the town that uh, has some teeth in it that assures us that there is going to be. Uh, some sort of regulation that uh, will make sure that uh, that that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mr. Uh, Barash, for your comments. Uh, tonight, under discussion item uh, 2627, we'll be discussed then in the applicants online, and we'll have the opportunity to address your comments at that point in time. If you just hang tight, okay? Sir? Okay, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Laura, do you have any other uh, letters, emails, or anyone online that would like to speak under privilege of the floor? That's um, all the letters I have. Is there anybody else on the line who wants to speak for privilege of the floor? Okay, thank you, Laura. And hearing no one, I will close privilege of the floor and move on with the agenda. Thanks again, Laura. Um, unfinished. We have no unfinished business tonight, so that brings us right to new business. And under new business, we have a couple of resolutions tonight. First resolution being resolution 2021-02, a resolution for site plan approval and a special use permit for a tenant change at 2207-2209 Knott Street, and that's the broken in. And as I typically do, I will at least summarize the conditions. The, the uh, uh, resolution is posted online for everyone to see. All right. And uh, as far as uh, the summary goes, Resolved that this planning board and zoning commission does hereby grant final site plan approval for a special use permit to allow a restaurant with bar, sit down or take out, no vehicle pickup and ordering facilities at 2207, 2209 Knott Street, subject to the following conditions. One, prior to site, prior to site disturbance, the applicant shall participate in a pre-construction pre meeting with the town of Nisiana and shall address any concerns raised by the town engineering or planning department. 1A, Final site plan shall include the location of appropriately accessible garbage cans or garbage dumpsters suitable for the anticipated needs of the restaurant. 1B, final site plan shall include a snow storage and removal plan so that no more than two parking spaces are utilized for the temporary storage of plowed snow for more than seven consecutive days. 1C, final site plans shall include a note indicating all parking spaces associated with 2207-2209 Knott Street will be newly striped with appropriate paint and that all spaces associated with the American with Disabilities Act will be configured and striped accordingly. Condition number two, prior to site disturbance, the site plan maps shall be modified to reflect the agreed upon decisions of the pre-construction meeting, if any, and distributed as required to the town and to all involved contractors. Final site plan shall be submitted to the town labeled for construction. Three, Prior to issuance of a final CL, the applicant shall submit proposed signage images to the planning board for review and approval via an amendment to this resolution. Four, prior to the issuance of a final CL, the applicant shall meet with the architectural review board and agree upon a plan and schedule for facade and lighting improvements to 2207-2209 Knott Street designed to enhance the neighborhood appearance of the restaurant. Five, the applicant is incurred is to encourage patrons of the Broken Inn restaurant to park in the parking spaces contiguous what hit 2207-2209 Knott Street. So I have a motion uh, for the resolution. I so move, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the resolutions move for adoption uh, by Mr. D'Arpino. Do I have a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Okay, seconded by Mr. Scributenis. Uh, and now we're gonna have some discussion here 
But one thing I'd like to start so we, we can include it in the discussion is I'm going to make a proposal for an additional condition. Um, looking at the package and I talked to Laura today and uh, she drafted some words which I agree with so I'm going to read that to you. So I'm going to propose an additional number condition number six. Because the proposed business hours are complementary to many of the existing uses as identified in the planning board's parking analysis, any increases to the hours outlined below would require further planning board review and approval. A, Mondays through Thursdays from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m., Fridays from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Sundays from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. So that proposed condition is basically the hours that the applicant has put forward. And as, as you all know, not only the planning department, uh, but the applicant himself has stated that these uh, hours are complementary to the business. There is, there's some overlap, um, either in some busy times there, but on a whole, um, as the, uh, either the hours for the um, uh, get later for the restaurant proposed bar, uh, the, the uh, parking tends to lighten up uh, as demonstrated by uh, information submitted by the applicant and uh, you know, and some common sense there. So I want to make sure we document that. So if there are any proposed changes, that would also give us an opportunity to, um, um, you know, update, you know, how things are going, or at least update uh, the hours if there are problems. So I'm going to make that uh, uh, motion uh, in a minute. Let's uh, talk about the resolution. Is there anything else that we want to talk about? Is there any other uh, thoughts on conditions that we want to add or or modify? Mr. Chairman, I, I went through the package and I saw the commitments from the other building owners for parking, and I wanted to know whether or not they those agreements would be in a leasehold agreement uh, or you know memorialized in some other way other than an agreement to agree. Okay. Well, we have the applicant online, uh, Mr. Nicky. Um, you know, we've asked, as you know, as pointed out by the public during the privilege of the floor tonight, you know, we have mentioned that we'd love to see something in writing and, uh, you know, goes back, but we haven't, you know, obviously gotten that. Uh, and, um, and for understandable reasons, as demonstrated by the applicant uh, and by the public, possible concerns with liability and so on and so forth. But to your point, Mr. Scrub Tennis, we, you know, we did hear, and I was going to mention this later on, from um, uh, either through uh, directly by letters or by information submitted by the applicant from the pharmacy, of course, which is the uh, building owner, the co-op, uh, Miski Wine and, Li and Liquors in 2219, which is uh, the past nail salon, but by that owner. Uh, we've heard from Ms. Gail King, you know, obviously it was a negative um, her input. Uh, I don't believe, and somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but the uh, parcel post store, I, can't, I, I think that's the name of it, I don't believe I've heard anything from them. I don't know if anybody else has, or if you have, Laura. But, uh, they are actually in part of Gail's building and a post. Okay, but a part of the Gail structure, okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if the applicant has an update. You know, it looks like he just left the meeting. Um, my question for the applicant, oh, there he is again. Uh, my question there would be, is there anything new to report regarding parking agreements? Um, Mr. Nicky, can you hear me? I can. I'm sorry. I had to reset because I couldn't get my microphone to work. Uh, good evening. Uh, well, all that we have currently is uh, a written agreement uh, from Lang's Pharmacy permitting us uh, to park on Knott Street and uh, Clifton Park Road um, on the um, where their property is. Um, there is no leasehold agreement with uh, with the other tenants uh, in the plaza uh, related to parking, which is to say we're not paying them for the rights to utilize their parking. Um, or parking that I would say is directly adjacent to their building. Um, although, as you've noted, we do have uh, favorable um, recommendations uh, from four of the five uh, property owners within the plaza. Yeah. Other questions or comments on the resolution? Concerns? Chairman, I, I was just thinking, I, I don't, I, through these conversations, there hasn't been any discussion of other prior leasehold agreements over the years with with that commercial space. And I kind of feel compelled to consider that parking around those storefronts and across the street as shared parking for that plaza, you know, including all of the, the commercial space. And you know, as a as a realtor, I've I've had a, a several clients, even in the past three months, talk a lot about the walkability aspects of certain areas of Niskuna, 
Um, I do agree with um, the, the prior uh, comment uh, about certainly there'll be drivers uh, attending and it won't be all walkers, but there is an intended purchasing criteria for new folks moving into the area. I have one client that's from the area. Her partner is from downstate and they've looked at certain corners around this unit and they've decided to make that walkability aspect the, the leading metric to buying. Um, so I'm just saying that with a, with a comprehensive plan that does have a very high focus on walkability and with you know, Ace Hardware opening up around the corner and having the co-op and having successful businesses like Lang's, it's reasonable to think that they're going to walk to the restaurant and it will add value to that community. So I just, these are some thoughts that went into my mind as we considered this project. Uh, walkability has also come up a lot with the positive comments that Laura's received. There's been several letters we've gotten, um, probably dozens, uh, regarding the positive aspects of, of continuing to allow that plaza to be successful with multiple businesses. So I, I just personally, I got to share, I only shop at co-op. I go at all different times of day. I can honestly say I've, I've never had to park across the street. Now, I've always been willing to back into Knott Street. That doesn't scare me, um, but I've always been able to find a parking spot and right on that side. So I, I do think with that plaza across the street, the leasehold would be great. Don't know of any pre-existing you know, uh, cases of that, but I see that as, a, as a, uh, an ample space for folks to park. Thank you, Mr. LaFlam. Thomas? I have a question, but my question might be a little bit more along a legal uh, path. We have Mr. Nikki's application in front of us. We are clear on the pre-existing non-conforming rules prior to the zoning code that does show that his business has adequate parking relative to that count. But we have an anticipated view, uh, an expectation that with the changes that we know is going to happen based on plans and drawings from the county and just the expected the, the 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 current usage and the expected usage of that area we know that relative to our code today the parking count doesn't you know doesn't get satisfied I, my question is can we hold up mr mr Nikki's application based on that anticipated view that future parking there's going to be a problem or do we actually cross that problem when we and deal with it when that becomes a reality? And that's mostly a question to Mr. Briggs. Do we have a legal basis based on anticipated or expected outcome that is not within the lines of our code to actually stop Mr. Lisi's application? You or do not postpone it. No, you don't. You don't have that right. And so that means that whenever our anticipated problem becomes a real problem, then we would actually be within our rights to address it. Well, once the use is in place, I don't think you can address a subsequent change and affect the current ongoing use. You'd address it as a town, Jengus, like as a holistic problem as a town, if the county's project creates unwanted, unintended consequences. Um, you would address that through the county and the town, not with a specific applicant. Yeah, and one of the things that, you know, when looking at the parking part of the analysis that was performed by, you know, the planning department and by the applicant and everyone's been involved, obviously, is that, you know, one of the, you know, obviously we all have concerns with parking, right? We know that we've been discussing it. Is that if the restaurant were not to go in, you know, based on the numbers that were provided, right? Uh, if somebody come in and, and wanted all that square footage that used to be with the barber shop and the beauty, I guess it was, right? It still uh, would apply to either the 200 or 250, 200 or 225 square foot per parking spot. So, you know, so again, it doesn't make it right. But if uh, if Mr. Nicky wasn't here and somebody came in for a retail shop that had a good, healthy business, um, you know, what would we say we wouldn't want that space to be utilized down to co-op? Uh, or would we be in the same position where we're at now? Obviously, the restaurant's a bit different, but the benefit, as I just as we just mentioned, of the of the restaurant is the, um, the off shift in hours, which 
may help the situation down there. And that's why I'm proposing that condition number six, that we uh, memorialize the hours that uh, Mr. Nicky is proposing for the restaurant. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, it was clear in my head, I think, given some of the comments we heard from the public, I just wanted to at least, you know, get on the record that there is a certain procedural legality that we follow in dealing with this application. Um, recognizing that, you know, to Laura's point, when if this will become a problem, then it will have to be a problem that the town will do something about. And we um, we had a little bit of a discussion, I think, two meetings, uh, you know, in our last meeting, right? And and I think definitely there, at least in my mind, I'm only speaking for myself relative to to Mrs. King's lot and and using it as a parking lot. I think some of the perception and facts have changed concerning what people used to think about that lot and I think what could potentially be something in the future. Um, but at least I know as a planning board member that there may be potential options in the future provided how serious this problem of parking becomes once the reality sets in of both the counties, the business going in and the county's renovation to the area. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Khan. I appreciate those comments. Um, let me let me do this. Since I, I'm going to put a motion on the floor to add condition number six, let's see if we get through that and we'll have some more discussion, okay? So again, I'm proposing that we amend the resolution to add condition number six. Um, if I can read it again if you'd like. It's basically uh, memorializing the hours that the applicant has put forward in his uh, application. Uh, and again, with the, with the thought there is that uh, extensive work has been done by the applicant and by the planning department, of course, the project lead and everyone to understand the, uh, the complementary nature of these hours and, and hopefully uh, it minimizes at least uh, some of the uh, traffic concerns or not traffic concerns, well, traffic concerns also, but parking concerns. So um, so I'm gonna make a motion that we add condition number six. Do I have a second on that? Chairman, second. Second. Chairman Walsh, I would like you to repeat the hours. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, the hours uh, and the condition are the same as the uh, letter from uh, the applicant, which is Monday through Thursdays from three to 10, Fridays from three to 11, Saturdays from nine to 11, and Sundays from nine to 10. Nine, no, excuse me, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., of course. Okay, and again, that was, if you look in the uh, packet uh, that was posted online, if you look at some of the original information that Mr. Nicky provided, those are the hours that he put forth there. So uh, I had a motion, I think I had a second, was that uh, Mr. Oster or Mr. Mr. Kahn's second? That's, uh, I'll second it. Okay, Mr. Kahn's second for the record. All right, so we have uh, uh, all those in favor of modifying the resolution, amending it with condition number six, sig signify by saying aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? Okay. All right. No one's opposed, so we have a uh, amended resolution that we can continue our discussion on. Um, again, I, you know, and it, you know, it's a tough one. But you know, if Mr. Nicky wasn't here and there was a different applicant, and I, I'm going to say this again for that square footage, you know, the analysis showed that it's basically a wash, and so uh, if it was a um, a retail store that was popular, uh, that, could, that square footage, we're gonna be in the same situation with parking. Um, uh, if if uh, the uh, uh, nail salon, I believe that's number um, 2219, uh, comes forward with an application, uh, um, you, know, we're gonna, you know, we wouldn't be able to say, I, I, don't, I don't see how we could say it's uh, uh, deny it based on today's standards. Uh, we'd never have storefronts and anything that leaves the co-op if we deny, deny, deny it on today's standards, we have a we have a unique situation there. That's the one thing that you know that kind of gets me there that I have a hard time with. But um, you know, as you know, I've talked about parking and harped on it for some time. Uh, but that's the thing that gets me there is that it's going to get utilized whether with this restaurant or uh, another uh, business that's approved in the um, uh, in the zoning district. Uh, it's a neighborhood commercial zoning district, so. That, that helps me. I know it doesn't satisfy the public because uh, you know there's concerns that the restaurant will uh, be a little bit more uh, intense from the uh, hour standpoint. You know, somebody may be sitting there for an hour having a meal, hour and a half, whatever, versus some retail places that you may stop in and uh, be in and out quickly, right? And so your that parking spot turns over faster. But that's not a guarantee. Type of retail that could go there could be a retail serv service that 
you know, the consumer may be in there for an extended period of time. So that's all, you know, we don't know what the future holds, obviously. Um, but we do know that uh, uh, we have a plaza, uh, it's zoned appropriately, uh, and, um, it, you know, something's going to go in there. And uh, in front of us is this restaurant that we've been, we've been working on. Thoughts from the rest of the board? So, so Mr. I have Chairman, oh, can, can I just ask, Jengis? So, in in page seventeen of the PDF, I just want to go back to the point I made before. Um, I, you know, I want to thank the applicant for getting a letter agreement from Lang's Pharmacy. But just for clarification, we have a we have an agreement to agree that the the, the the owner has will allow, according to the letter, access to twenty two parking spots. But will that be memorialized in your lease agreement with the owner? I just want to clarify clarify this point with the with the with the applicant. Is it oh, buying? So you're looking for the landlord to put in the lease that same language? Is that what you're stating? Well, I think you would want it as well. I mean, even more importantly than us, wouldn't you want that established in your leasehold agreement with the landlord? I'm happy to have that drafted if, if that's uh, important. What I would say is it's uh, we've always worked similar to what, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, um, Mr. LaFlemme talked about earlier, uh, under the understanding and assumption that we pay rent there and parking in front of that space would just be shared parking. We took that extra step to go and get the letter from the landlord to provide to this board. But... Um, Look, if, if you think that it's uh, something that, that uh, tips the scale for us to have a, uh, a document from the landlord uh, that's included as a, an addendum uh, to our lease, we can have that within the hour. It's certainly not anything that um, would be problematic for us or for them. Um, but I believe at the end of the day, we end up right back in the same spot we're in right now. I, th I think it's in, in your best interest. I'm, I'm making the argument because I think it's actually in your interest and the interest of, I think, the town, dude, just so we, it's established and you have rights and remedies to make sure that in case something were to happen with the landlord, that you have access to those parking spots. Um, anyways, I, I, I don't want to drive home a point. I don't know if other members of the board have a similar interest, but Laura, I don't know if, if you're all concerned with a letter agreement. I just think since it's a key issue with the applicant, just having it established and having legal rights and remedies to those spots would be a, a benefit to everybody. I, I guess I don't have an uh, opinion either way. I'm not an expert in that field, but I, I do know that Mr. Nicky is obviously um, acquiring the space from Langs, right? And uh, um, with, the, with, the, uh, um, with the letter that we received stating that it's okay to park there uh, whether and i saw but again i'm not an attorney or uh, um, uh, deeply involved in uh, what it really takes but it seems to me that uh, we have an agreement um, for mr nicky from the landlord that it's okay to park there but um, again i if there's something the board feels that we need to uh, supplement that you know i'm okay with it if it's a majority of the board I, I, I would support Mr. Scrubby Tennis' statement, and I do think actually it primarily affects. I actually don't think it does anything for the town because I think we've already clearly stated what what constraints and right and 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 legal position that we're we're in. But I think it does help you, Mr. Nietzsche, that that the lease agreement does reflect that. You know, ownership changes, right? And um, I think it would be good if you yeah. did have that commitment reflected from the from the landlord. Well, that, that's um, nice. Interesting point, Mr. Khan, about ownership changing. I didn't, you know, think of that angle. You know, uh, I don't know if there's any plans on the in the immediate future, but that's a good protection for the uh, for the applicant. Uh, but then again, remember the term. You know, we made a determination that it's a a, a plaza. So uh, even though he may have a parking agreement there, if somebody parks somewhere else, they're still still okay. Um, uh, as far as you know, where we're at right now, it's still okay. Right. I just I just wanted to point out to you guys that this is not typical in in which the parking spaces are privately owned on private property. And so to the extent that you can, you know, get as much formal agreement among landlords and tenants as you can, that would be great. But 
it's not a case where you can actually do like a, a legally recorded cross parking agreement because you're not the underlying landowner. Like this property in particular, maybe owns a little bit more of the parking spaces than the majority of the buildings do um, because their line kind of goes away from the building as it goes north. But um, the still like over half of the parking spaces are actually like publicly owned. So I don't think that you can get as formal as we saw like at 1969 uh -huh. Union Street or St. Catteries or something because it's not, it's not a case of being able to deed responsibility of these parking spaces across the board with one another. The only place that you can do that <laughs> is in the um, parking spot that the co-op owns because they own it, which is the one that's across the road. That's the only one <laughs> that is owned and that you could actually get an easement that would allow additional parking on. The other ones, I don't think that you can get that. Yeah, yeah and Laura, you know, let me speak just for myself here. Everything around parking agreements, to your point, from my perspective in my head in thinking about this program, I've seen it as all just been recommendations and optionals for exactly the reason that you've mentioned, right? And that's why I think, you know, Mrs. Kirby Dennis, you know, Michael, that, you know, I think the town's position is clear relative to the pre-existing non-conforming to parking count relative to that, et cetera, right? So any of this helps Mr. Le Mr. Nietzsche and it may or may not help him, but, you know, to, to Laura's point, right, or at least for, as a voting planning board member, whether or not those parking agreements are in place for at least the parking adjacent to the, not the co-op across the street, we had talked about that before, right? It, it, it's, it's, it, I don't think it has a big bearing on our decision. It, it doesn't, it doesn't have a bearing in our decision, right? It's, it's, um, if they're there, it's good that they're there. If not, then it, it doesn't really, you know, affect us you know, denying or saying no to this application. And may I, may I speak to that? Under the, under the circumstances, you cannot make that a condition. Right. If the applicant wants to have some security, that's fine, but the, this board doesn't have that authority to make that a condition under okay. these circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do have one procedural adjacent question, and I guess Paul, I'm sorry, you know, you know, you'll probably involve in this answer too. What what does it look like to make that plaza conform to the current code? What are the things that would have to happen? It's not going to happen. So Tear it's down impossible. Build a whole new plaza. Okay, so so I mean, okay, so that that is the only way that happens, right? Then, yes. So that is yeah. the answer, right? It's not that it's not, but that entire plaza would have to be, you know demolish and repurpose and built as a new plaza then and then at that point can it only be subject to the current codes that we have correct okay i just wanted to state or understand that better and, and uh, i just add to that thank you mr briggs and, and mr khan uh and uh, based on some of the research that mr henry did you know there's this floor area ratio calculation so it isn't just parking that makes it non-compliant it's the uh, size and uh, the business relative to the, the uh, square footage of the lot itself, which impacts that floor, I think it was called floor area ratio. Uh, I think the only one that uh, met or, or, or exceeded the requirement was the co-op. All those businesses uh, also have that part of their non-conformance. We have a unique situation here, you know. Would we be able to, um, just in addressing some of the, the neighbors to the property's concerns about parking, um, I mean, I'm not sure we could make it a requirement, but suggest to uh, Mr. Nitchie that he, um, you know, even put something, whether it's, you know, something on his menu or something to reinforce to anybody coming to his restaurant to be parking in the designated parking spots and not, you know, on the street, you know, there's no parking signs around that in front of residences. Well, that's our intent, and I've actually, the two neighbors who wrote letters uh, for Privilege of the Floor earlier today, I've actually spoken to uh, one of them already. Uh, I didn't meet with the other one uh, to let them know that it'll be on our website. It'll be prominent uh, anywhere where you find our marketing um, because we're not interested in, I mean, look, we would love to be able to satisfy everyone. Clearly, we've not yet crossed that, 
Um, but I think that once we're open and doing things the right way and we address these concerns that can really only be addressed once you're open, um, that we might, you know, hopefully get to a point where we've pleased and satisfied all parties. Um, but yes, it'll prominently be featured on our uh, internet website, social media presence, et cetera, um, before you actually get there and, and walk in the door. Um, and I do believe that's already um, one of the requirements uh, per what Chairman Walsh had said. Um, mm -hmm. If I was, I, I, this is the first I'm hearing of those. I'm sorry, I just was reading them uh, a short minute ago or a moment ago. Um, but I do believe that's something that's already being uh, required uh, or a contingency of this uh, potential approval. And that's correct, Mr. Mickey. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ms. Shinfield. Condition number five, the applicant is is to encourage patrons of the broken in restaurant to park in the parking spaces contiguous with 2207-2209. And so we didn't give them the, the detail how to encourage. So your point, uh, you know, a web page or a menu, a sign inside the restaurant, uh, you know, talking to patrons, whatever methods Mr. Nicky can utilize to keep harmony in the neighborhood and with the businesses, you know, and that's, you know, that's kind of a loosey goosey condition, but you know, the intention is uh, to um, promote any way you can to uh, uh, share the parking and minimize the impact on the neighborhood. So, again, I, I know this doesn't satisfy everybody, Mr. Nicky, but anything you can do, obviously, uh, would, would help us all. Please. Look, we, we, I want the same thing. And I think most of the items that we've talked about, I want the same thing that the neighbors want, that this board wants. I want my patrons to park as close as possible to the door. I want it for safety reasons. I want it for a variety of, of, of reasons. I don't want them to park further away than need be. Um, so of course we'll encourage that. But I think that they also, being patrons, would like to park as close to the door as possible. I don't think that we'll have patrons who will see a parking space in front of our business and say, you know what, I'm gonna go park on Clifton Park Road instead. Um, now I could be wrong. I can't you know, be responsible for how everyone makes decisions as to whether they wanna have a nice meal and then walk it off to get to their car afterwards. But I think uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, people want to park uh, as close as is available at the time to the business that they're, you know, they're patronizing. Yep. And we also have to recognize there'll probably be some, uh, still some events that may occur down there. And there may be some, you know, peak times where the restaurant is busier. It may, you know, obviously you'd like to have as busy as possible, keep it full. But there's also, you know, other businesses there that, you know, could be peaking at the same time. So, you know, we're going to have to see how it all works out. Um, and that's why I want, again, another reason to um, make sure we put the times that you have, have stated in the conditions. So um, because of the analysis saying that they're, they're complementary. Sure. Now, just from my own knowledge, I don't want to hold this up, but uh, obviously Mr. Briggs is, I believe, is an attorney for the board. Is there everything... Uh, in his opinion, that's listed as a requirement uh, legal to ask that of uh, of the business. And I, I ask that also in regards to um, you know, the, the building owner, uh, I would imagine, would be the responsible party uh, to snow removal um, or a, a plan as to which parking spaces are used for snow removal. I'm certainly uh, willing and able to do that. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, that's something that, uh, for example, of these requirements that are being laid out, um, that uh, legally makes uh, sense for the board to ask of us. Yes, the planning board has broad authority to make these requirements. Okay, thank you. And I, I hopefully, in, I, and I would expect you to be able to execute them. I think they seem reasonable. Uh, you have to get the uh, Mr. Lang on board. Um, they do, and we've 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 talked to this. You know, all of those points that are in there are issues that were either discussed at last meeting, the meeting before, or that I've since addressed, as you know, via email, um, relative to trash and striping and things of that sort. So, um, uh, look, it's it, it's uh, certainly process is uh, not as easy as signing a lease, getting a key, and opening the door. But there isn't anything that we've uh, addressed so far, or that was listed earlier today, that we uh, aren't ready, willing, and able to accomplish. Okay. Any other thoughts from the board? Comments? Concerns? Positive notes? I'll mention one thing. A lot of people now, if they're going out to dine, are taking advantage of Uber and Lyft and those kinds of services so they don't have to worry about parking. They don't have to worry about driving home. Okay. 
All right. Uh, everybody's had an opportunity to be heard here and no other comments. Uh, do you have anything else, Mr. Nikki, before we take the roll call? No, I, um, uh, I appreciate everybody's time and hopefully everyone's seen uh, the package that I submitted that has all of the notes. Uh, and I think Laura had it in today's package um, from people who unsolicited stated that they look forward to walking uh, to this space as, as I, who also live in the neighborhood. Um, again, uh, Mr. LaFlemme said, I, I don't know that I would have moved to Avon Crest, for example, because I want to be able to walk to get a cup of coffee or a newspaper. Um, even if I don't do it as often as uh, my body tells me I should be doing it, especially when it's cold outside, um, having that option was enough for me to, to make the decision to make this my home. So um, again, uh, we had over 40 people unsolicited who reached out and said, this is someplace that I'd like to walk to. So um, that's it. I uh, don't want to hold you up any longer. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, uh, Mr. Henry, would you please call the roll? Mr. Laflamme. Aye. Mr. Scrabutenis. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. McPartlon. Aye. Mr. Darpino. Aye. Mr. Oster. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Uh, I'm just before I vote, just want to make one more comment before I vote. And that, that is, again, check the, uh, anybody listening in or watching, check uh, the resolution online. Uh, this hasn't been done in a vacuum. We've had, as Mr. Nicky and, and the planning boards put a lot of time into this, and so has the town. And if you take a look at the uh, resolution, all the different whereas is in the resolution, you got to remember, we had a public hearing. You know, we've heard from the public, both pros and cons, and we've heard from both. The town board had a public hearing. They've heard pros and cons and uh, uh, from residences. Um, and uh, in fact, I looked at their uh, information uh, in the minutes. And, uh, you know, again, we've heard from quite a few people. So the, the system um, you know, has worked and uh, there's been quite a bit of information. Uh, we also heard from the Conservation Advisory Council, their uh, advisory to the town board. And they recommended uh, uh, the town board as lead agency issue a negative secret declaration. And all, again, all this is in the resolution. Um, and uh, so we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, am I 100% confident? No. Am I confident enough based on the resolution that we have on the applicant and on the, uh, the potential for this work? And I am, and that's why I'm going to vote yes. Uh, and so this resolution uh, motion carries the resolution is passed. Um, uh, you know, I believe um, Ms. Nikki will do a good job and uh, the work out. And I think the town center overlay district, which we've heard some comments on, is the town center overlay district. Um, you know, it is a walkable area. You know, again, the, I think the hardware stores, uh, in my opinion, is it's a, it's a great addition to that area. Uh, little plaza across the street, the co-op. Uh, we got, I think it's 24 unit apartment building going in nearby. Um, um, obviously they can also walk over to the shop right into the Mexican restaurant in the shop right plaza, uh, but the Mr. Nikki's uh, restaurant and all the other businesses uh, either currently or coming someday to the co-op plaza um, uh, or all event, you know, something that those people uh, in that town center district in that whole area will be able to utilize. So again, I vote yes and the resolution is passes. Any other further comments on the subject? All right, Mr. Nicky. Obviously, uh, uh, good luck and, uh, and we'll, you know, everybody will be watching. Obviously, I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, we're looking forward to the restaurant and uh, we want it to be successful and, uh, and best wishes from the planning board. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. And thank you, board. I know we spent a lot of time on this. It's not an easy one, but I appreciate your hard work on all this. All right. So we got another resolution. Um, resolution 2021-03, a resolution for site plan approval for a tenant change at 3413 State Street. And that's iFix Pro. And again, I'll summarize this brief resolution. And that is resolved that the Planning Board and Zoning Commission find the above reference site plan meets the requirements of the zoning code and previous site plan approvals and therefore hereby approves the site plan and tenant change. And since we didn't have a project lead, I'll keep it brief. So I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the resolution for this site plan and tenant change um, at, at uh, 3413 State Street. Do I have a second? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. Oster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oster. 
uh, and any discussion. I do know that we have Mr. Alam online with us tonight, uh, the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Alam. Um, maybe before we vote, since uh, we haven't had you, um, you know, we're familiar with the discussion. You know, we had a discussion at the last meeting. Maybe uh, take this opportunity to tell us briefly about your business. Yeah, you're on mute, sir. You're on mute. Cell phone, sorry, sorry, person. Uh, cell phone, tablet repair, and I sell accessories. You know, um, like somebody broke glass or like something. Cell phone, mobile phone repairing stuff. I do and and tablet, like iPad. Yeah, this kind of device I repair, and I sell their cover case and accessory stuff. Okay, and uh, is this your first business, or do you have another uh, location? No, this is my first business. Sir. Okay, um, I will state that um, you know, as we all know from um, discussion we had before, that this is retail to retail, so it's a straightforward forward tenant change. The signs uh, we discussed, and the, the rear sign which faces the inner road has come into co compliance, so all three signs are compliant. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, or questions for the applicant? So uh, my sign and front side and back sign, two, three signs, small. Yeah, they're all com yeah, they're all compliant. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, President. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, no. hearing none, Mr. Henry, please call the roll. Mr. Laflamme. Aye. Mr. Scribby Tennis. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Mr. Darpino. Aye. Mr. Oster. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Aye. Uh, motion carries. The resolution passes. And um, uh, thank you, Mr. Alam. Good luck with your business with iFix Pro. And uh, yes, sir. hopefully, I won't need your services, but uh, it's good to know. Yeah. You. I like to invite you all for any any kind of cell phone problem. <laughs> I can fix it. Okay, I'll, thank you, okay. sir. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, sir. And good luck. All right, and that's it for new business tonight. And we have several, or we have a few discussion items, I should say. First discussion item being 2627 Troy Road application for approval of the plat plan, and that's a four lot minor subdivision. Uh, and we have Mr. McPartland, and the applicant is also online. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. McPartland. You have anything for us tonight? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't, there's there's not much new to report here. Um, by now, I trust everybody's had a chance to review the um, the the SWIP um, and we're just waiting on TDE review. So um, we'll see what comments come out of that. Certainly drainage is an issue that's been raised um, by anyone who's uh, toured the site from the planning board or town, as well as many residents in the area. Uh, I would like to um, have a brief discussion about the issue raised by Dr. Barash, one of the neighbors um, adjacent to this proposed subdivision. Certainly, um, I'd like to make sure we explore all of our options for um, control of, of the conditions that are made for subdivision um, and in, ensure that um, Joel or, or anyone who's performing the work on the site, um, you know, acts in good faith and, and and works closely with the town um, or, or possibly even, you know, has as good of a relationship with uh, with the neighbors as, as I believe Joel has attempted to foster. So um, I, I think it's an encouraging sign that um, the the purchasers of the three parts, the potential three parcels um, are all related. It sounds as though um, the intent is for them to um, 
you know, build there and stay there and, and have, um, um, you know, vested interest in, um, you know, being good neighbors. Um, so, and, and I'm also encouraged by the fact that Joel um, has, has outlined to those potential buyers some of the concerns that have been raised by neighbors um, and has told has made representations to us that he's communicated the limits of clearing and um, basically the limits of development in general um, on the site. On the site. So, um, yeah, with that, I just, I, I, I'd like to you know, open it up to discussion uh, with, with other board members to see, you know, what ideas we have besides, um, you know, conditions in, in our, in our resolution, uh, for site, for, for subdivision to, to ensure that, um, whoever builds these homes and develops the site, um, keeps that development in, in, in keeping with the, the character of the neighborhood and, um, limits any environmental disturbances. Thank, thank you, Mr. McPartland. I, you know, we all share your concern because that was news to us also. Uh, you know, if Mr. Uh, well, Joe's online, so I'll let him speak in a moment. You know, if you were to build the homes and put them up for sale, um, you know, you have people you don't know, you know, again, you don't know who's, who would buy them. Kind of actually has some benefit here because Mr. Design knows who is coming, so he's able to communicate, which is a nice benefit. Um, and I know uh, Laura will do our best to make sure any conditions that are concerns that we need to address, we'll make sure that they are in the resolution. And as you all know, the resolution is binding on whoever uh, develops the property, whether it be Joel or, or someone else. Um, Joel, uh, maybe you have anything you'd like to add or comment regarding any discussions you had with the potential, uh, um, I guess, owner or developer? Sure. Um, the one, uh the customers are, um, it's the Griner family and it's two brothers and a sister and the sister's married name is Powers, uh, Mike and Christy Powers. And they, they're in the Niskayuna school system. They have five young kids. They're in the lacrosse program and they're going to build a large house. They're going to build a, I heard him say a six bedroom house. So, uh, Barash's concern about um, value of the homes. I think that the homes to be built will probably far surpass, you know, the other homes on Shannon Boulevard. Um, the Griners are builders. If you go to their website, you know, they, they built some pretty large, uh, large houses. They all have actually large houses. Um, they just want to build and live together as a family compound. So I'm pretty confident that they're going to build really nice houses. And what I've said is that in my uh, purchase contract with the Griners, um, it's contingent upon me um, roughing in the driveway, uh, putting in the culvert, you know, fulfilling the SWIP requirements, and clearing the area of the houses. Um, and now that's that's you know the requirements, you know, in the, in the plan where that, you know, I would cut as few trees as possible. Um, and that's, that's what I intend to do. You know, I intend to work with, with the town to spot the trees that we're going to cut, but there is no real, uh, way that I can control, you know, if, if the people want to come in and cut additional trees, I mean, um, and I don't think, uh, there is any way that the planning board control can control that either. Um, you know, but I've gotten pretty much their confirmation that, you know, they're not going to clear cut. So, you know, especially the trees in the front and in the front yard. Um, that's about, what about site grading, uh, Joel. Pardon? What about regrading the site for the uh, foundations? Yeah, that's uh, not for the foundations, but I'm required for the uh, the SWIP uh, the SWIP changes that we're going to make. So in other words, that that driveway when I take the driveway 
uh, off of Route 7 and put it on the Shannon Boulevard for the existing home, you know, lot number four, you know, that's a pretty big hill. So I'm going to grade that hill down, down Shannon Boulevard, you know, to essentially, you know, smooth out that culvert a little bit. Uh, but lot number two has a culvert. So, you know, I'll install that culvert, you know, and I'll install the stone for the driveway. So I, I rough in the driveway, cut the area of the house. And what everybody has to remember, too, is that, you know, I am uh, stabilizing the Craig Yee house. You know, I'm putting a lot of effort into saving that. And I could have just tore it down. And also, don't forget the 1.5 acre, this, this is now called the Overlook. So the Overlook Park, and there was actually people there today. You know, there's, there's a, essentially somebody uses that that parking area every every single day, you know. And uh, once it's publicly known that it's a town park, I'm sure it's going to get a lot of uh, lot of use. It's going to be very popular. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Hey, and Laura, we have some standard conditions for, uh, you know, subdivision approval about finished floor uh, uh, elevations, making sure they're confirmed. Uh, so that it doesn't require excessive grading uh, or the house isn't higher than what's expected or, or lower, I guess. Right. So that's all standard language that would carry on for no matter who the uh, who actually builds the home. That's, that's correct, Kevin. It's uh, the finished grade elevation of the garage floor has to be 18 inches above the crown of Shannon Boulevard. And that's all in the paperwork, right, Joel? That's being reviewed by the town designated engineer. No, that's in code. That's a code code requirement. Yeah, Joel, Kevin's talking about the like. I think your plan should show like an um, like a House like a elevation. Shot, floor elevation or or ground floor elevation. And I think when you're building it, you can only go six inches higher or lower, or you have to get uh, engineering approval. Okay, <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that, but well, I guess I have. Most yeah, buildings yeah. don't go over six inches. Okay, can you, can you have this? Can that be one of the key comments? That's a standard comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, but you know, I kind of wish that somebody brought it up earlier. So just if you roll that into the TDE package, we'll incorporate it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm bringing it up because I, you know, I see the, you know, obviously the conditions from previous subdivision approvals. And I know that uh, we've, the town potentially has run into issues where um, they couldn't satisfy that and they had to come back to the, uh, you know, engineering or planning department in order to modify the, the home. So all I'm saying is to make sure that uh, we understand what that is and it's a condition uh, in the resolution. And that would give uh, the residents or the neighbors some uh, um, satisfaction. I don't say, you know, some have them understand that, you know, there's more to it than what you, when you walk away, you know, they still have to build it within uh, compliance of the, uh, the code and sure. the resolution that's passed. That's all y'all. So, but I mean, if, when the TDE um, reviews this, Kevin, uh, it's pretty cut and dry. I mean, it's, it's well sloped, well drained. It's lower in elevation than all the neighbors. Water flows downhill. Uh, the hydrology is such that, you know, somebody comes in and puts the house is going to be well above Shannon Boulevard. It's going to drain down to the the small creek and into the Lysha Kill, just like it has for eons. You know, so we're really not affecting that much. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. It's four, it's three simple lots, well sloped, well drained. Uh, Laura's comment with the with the grading, you know, excessive grading, you know, I don't think the grinders are going to come in and carve out the whole site and make cliffs and, you know, and change the grading dramatically. I'm, I'm almost positive they're going to work within the confines of, uh, of the uh, topography. Yeah, so we, this, this we is just... We did talk to about that you know because like the the one uh the powers like lot number one you know because they have so many kids and they they kind of want them away from 
the uh, the cliff, you know. So uh, they're going to take lot number one. They're going to build a pretty big house, and they're going to have a walkout, you know. So they're they're not going to overly grade the heck out of that lot. Joel, that all sounds great, and you know, to be fair, when we first kind of discussed how these homes would look. Um, I think you went so far as to say they would be Frank Lloyd Wright-esque. So you set yourself a pretty high bar there. And I think it was already um, hinted at uh, the fact that the Architectural Review Board could have some um, teeth in ensuring that these these three proposed homes um, aren't uh, deleterious to existing home values and are in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, so Patrick, I don't ever... that should be a condition of, of subdivision approval that all three homes um, are reviewed by the ARB, full, full lands with elevations and landscaping. I, you know, uh, Pat, this is my ninth subdivision in this queue and I've never seen a requirement like that. The only time I had to have that done is when I built on Broman Avenue because I bought the lot and I subdivided it off of uh, the hospital. So the hospital actually had a, a uh, it was, it was a deed restriction that they, they review the house, but there is no, the planning board can't come in and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong and sit here and say that, you know, I have to build a, you know, 3,500 square foot, six bedroom house, greater in value than $700,000 in, in the before has to review. I mean, I, you know. Well, I've laid out my concerns. You know, it's, it's mainly, it's kind of concerns that you've addressed. It's um, exacerbating any, any existing draining issues. It's clear cutting the loss of mature growth trees and, and, the character of the neighborhood. Yeah, well, the only thing I can say there is that, you know, I've agreed to as much as as much as in my control. In other words, you know, I sold the lot, you know, I'm going to put the driveways in, I'm going to clear cut, or I'm going to, not clear cut, I'm going to cut the trees in the house location. I already have the houses staked out. You know, and we're, and we're going to cut trees within, say, 20, 25 feet, you know, for construction purposes. All right. So it is what it is. And, you know, I've heard this before from neighbors, you know, like particularly when I did Oakmont, you know, people complain that, who their housing values are going to go down. Well, I'd like to knock on those neighbors' doors these days and say, hey, can you kindly upgrade your house? You know, because we built $700,000 houses and geez, your house is only 200, you know, you're ruining my neighborhood, you know. Uh, I've never built an infill or a subdivision where the houses were less valuable than the existing neighborhood. And Genghis, I see you're shaking your head, but that's, that's a fact. That's well, a fact. Joel, you can stand by your record all you like. Yeah, and yeah, Joel, let me extend my headshot. Sure. Take away from you the contributions you've made, but, but we, you've, you've said yourself, you can't make any representations about how these buyers will build. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mr. McPartland. So, Joel, well, that's, you're that's not building these houses, right? That's why I'm trying to be open with you guys and the new spirit of openness, you know? No, 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 uh, no. I, <laughs> agreed, but I mean, don't, you know, so the point, you know, anything that you, Joel, have done in the past relative to building houses is not applicable here because you're not gonna be building the houses. But pretty much, you know, I've seen their plans the people that I sold it to, and like I said, they're going to build a six-bedroom house. You know, it's got to be thirty-five hundred minimum square feet for six bedrooms. You know, it's going to be a a big, expansive house. So, Joel, I mean, we can't force you to build a three thousand or them to build a three thousand five hundred square foot home or set a, a value limit to the home. But in the past, we haven't had an architectural review board, and we do now. And the reason for the architectural review board is um, to make sure, and it's not binding, but it's to make sure that the homes are in character and keeping with the neighborhood and that you're looking at the existing architecture and you're not building something that's neon orange <laughs> or whatever. So um, 
I do you think can put that, that, that. Yeah, you can put that request for, for referral to the Architect Review don't Board. Have a, you don't yeah, it, and, it, and the other thing is that I can share quickly just that just to clarify what Kevin was saying, and so you might want to just make sure that your engineer knows and understands it. This has been a standard condition in in all subdivisions since I've been a planner and since you know 20 years before I was a planner. And I'm sure it was in Campbell Court and Oakmont and others. Um, but what we're really talking about is that on your plans, it shows the ground floor, finished floor, you know, of 289 here, 280. 1.5 and 275 and that's because oh, they're figuring out what that foundation elevation is in relationship to the grading so that when you're doing that subdivision plan you're figuring out where that grading is going to be and we have that tolerance so that you don't raise that house like for instance this 289 one you don't put like a 270 or no you don't put like a you know like a 295 one and just bring in like a ton of fill because that's not what we figured out was going to happen for subdivision so it just it's a tolerance that you have to stay in um on these homes based on the grading that was reviewed for the subdivision plan if that makes sense yeah i didn't even know we did that laura yeah and it's not like you can't go over it but if you do go over it you trigger a new engineering so you just double check that foundation based on the plans that you know already double check that elevation um because we do stick to it and it's been in every single subdivision approval that i've ever seen Oh, good. So it's there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would think that the grinders and the powers wouldn't have a problem with reviewing their house plans with the architectural review board because they'll probably be proud of the houses that they're building. Yes, yes thanks, Joel. And, and thank you, Mr. McPartland. And so, yeah, so the thing here is obviously different, right? So some point you hand it off uh, to the, the new builder, right? Um, or the right. building next to home. And so I understand your concern, Joel, about, uh, you know, uh, letting go and not being held accountable for uh, uh, that point forward. So my question would be to maybe Laura or maybe to Mr. Briggs, we do have an architectural review board. Architectural review board has, you know, a lot of benefit and it might help uh, uh, um, um, help uh, the neighbors, you know, understand that uh, we're taking a look at it and it'll be in keeping with the neighborhood. Um, so the question is, how can we do that? Is one way, Laura, potentially to um, uh, when they come in for a building permit for the house to make that part of that process? Do we have that flexibility, you think? Yeah, I mean, we, but um, we've just been doing this, I think, almost as a standard thing now that we have an architectural review board. Even the approval that you just issued to Thomas Nicky had a referral to the architectural review board to have that double check and make sure that actually the facade <laughs> and the lighting are harmonious with the surrounding neighborhood. So I think that um, it can just be a fairly standard condition that the architectural review board review these single family homes when the building permit is submitted um, to ensure they're in keeping with the, you know, consistency. And like, it's not like, and David can explain it too. I mean, it's not, um, it's not like the stockade where whatever the architectural review board says you you have to do, but they, I mean, but they do offer really good comments and review the whole project in the context of the neighborhood and offer, you know, sometimes you know, economical things to do that will make the whole thing more harmonious with everything else that's around it. It can be just as simple as like changing a roof line. Um, and I've seen them do it. They're amazing. I really, really like listening and <laughs> I love they're very good and they're not mean and they work with what's submitted to them um, to, to just make it better. Okay. So Joel, we if, you know we get to a point for approval of the subdivision. I mean those uh, that resolution will be passed on to the uh, you know we just have to ensure that's passed on to the new uh, builders, I guess owners slash builders. Um, sure. So they can complete anything that they need to complete, to, you know, to satisfy the requirements and to uh, make us feel good. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's going to be a problem. I'll be honest with you. You know, it sounds like you're going to build some nice places over there. So I don't expect the problem. But to Laura's point, it doesn't hurt, and it's advisory and it's free, and uh, you know, it's something. Obviously, time is money too. But uh, you know, it's probably it's going to be in the resolution as a condition. So what I hear. So. Yeah, I've been using it because uh, we're actually they they've come through and looked at the existing house. They looked at the park. Uh, they're trying to Dennis Brennan and Mike Davey 
and the Architectural Review Board are trying to set up a um, a Zoom meeting, but I said, why don't they just come to the house on uh, 26, 27? You know, they want to review the history of it. And actually, just as a note, the, uh, the Times Union came in and interviewed me and took a bunch of pictures. And uh, I don't know if they called you, Laura, but I, I told them to give you a call. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're doing a story, I think it's next Sunday, on the Craigie House. And they might throw something there on the Mesa, uh, Mesa House, too. Great. Well, it sounds like we're, you know, we're pretty much, it sounds like we're in agreement and we'll get through it. Um, yeah. And we have this, again, the town designate, designated engineers got to do their job. But, you know, again, Joe, it's a pretty good submittal. Uh, don't expect any surprises, but that's what they're for, right? So we'll see what they have to say. No, I think I think it's going to come out real nice. I mean, fixing up the corner house, um, you know, you know, hopefully the grinders won't clear cut it. You know, but, uh, I don't think they will, but they definitely aren't going to cut the trees in the front. They told me, and of course you have the, the buffer of the town park in the back. Yeah. Joel, right. what trees are, are there trees that are greater than four inches in diameter, which you need to cut for a roughing in a driveway? Yes. Yeah. And, um, Laura, has the town or the tree council or the planning department in general had a chance to walk the site to specifically identify which ones could be salvaged? Um, so the, the tree council has a, had a couple meetings on this subdivision and um, is really available at any time to do a walkthrough. They were waiting for the, the corners of the houses to get staked and the driveway locations to be kind of finalized. So I think made more sense for the engineering to be mostly completed so you knew kind of exactly where stuff was going to go and then you could really look at if you could just you know squeeze it you know to the right or the left a little bit to save a tree but um they're ready and willing to look and they also have talked about bringing in an expert from the landis arboretum just to look at the land in the back because i know patrick you were there when we did that walk through but <laughs> From my experience, like it's very likely that some of those trees are are old growth, like with the size and the branching patterns and stuff that they have and the steep slopes. Typically they didn't clear. You can find a lot of old growth on steep slopes because they just weren't usable for farming um, and such things. So they are actually bringing in like an expert to just see if that is old growth. So the town could even say like, this is a patch of like really amazing habitat of old growth that we're saving. But the old growth really doesn't extend, I don't think, all the way to the road, um, probably because it gets less steep there. But um, yeah, they're ready and willing and able to go out and take a look at the trees. And I think a standard condition that we also have now in subdivision approval is that they would um, do a site visit and take a look at it with um, Joel. And then the other thing is that he did add street trees, um, which I asked him. So I think he's got two, two per lot on there. So yeah. he'll be taking some down, but he's also going to be mitigating by planting some in the right of way. Yeah, that's true. Hey, uh, one other thing too is, Laura, I'm ready to, uh, you know, actually put X marks on trees. What what's that process? Do I do do I call you and or get the tree council there or? Yeah, if you have a date, why don't you go ahead and email me and I will coordinate it with the tree council because they are looked at this project multiple times and they're really at the point where they're just ready to schedule a site walk. I'd, I'd like to attend that walk as well. Okay, Patrick, we'll make sure that you are invited to that. Thank you. I'll let it warm up a little bit. It's a little too cold to spray paint now. <laughs> No, the tree council, when we were doing Amador subdivision, I think it was negative one and they were out there for multiple hours and we lost our phones because um, our phones just couldn't stay. The batteries just wouldn't stay. Tree council is tough. It doesn't matter what the weather is. They're a bunch of woodchucks. <laughs> they like the weather, cold weather. All right. All right. All right. So so it sounds like we're waiting on engineering, Mr. McPartland, and uh, we have some suggestions to make sure that we uh, uh, have the architectural review board, including uh, any new potential builders. And uh, sounds like a, a, a engineering review and tree council is what's up next. 
Anything Laura, else? could you could you set that up? Any I'm I'm available anytime. I'm not going out of town, right? Yeah, yeah. Pants, right. I'll I'll send out an email and gather times. Uh, can we talk about timing? I mean, uh, if we if the TDE comes back and we incorporate the TDE comments, is is the resolution set for the February eighth meeting then for approval? Um, let's ask Mr. McFarland if we get, you know, we have time to review the conditions, uh, make sure they're adequate. I don't see why not. Neither do I. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so Lord, if you set that tree cutting up and you can notify the neighbors too, I mean, we can make it, you know, like we said, very open so everybody knows. Well, they'll see the trees that we'll mark. We'll mark. Oh, you might have lost your there, Joel. Yeah. Okay, we might have lost we might have lost Joel there, but uh, bottom lines. Well, if, I could, if I could just make a suggestion, Joel, I don't know if you can still hear us. Being that um, it sounds like you're moving along with a potential sale, I think it might make sense to at least extend an invite to the future owners of these parcels for that walkthrough, if only to impress upon them the importance of you know the the amount of um, effort that's gone into um, the design of this site that's, thus far. That's a great idea. I'll I'll definitely do that. I'll invite all three. They'll Thanks. show up. Yeah, great suggestion, Mr. McPartland, and thank you, Joel, for uh, supporting that. Um, you know, at least give them the option if they don't show. What can we do? But yeah, at least invite them. That sounds great. Yeah, um, I mean that that's great to impress upon them, Pat, because they've heard it from me, but. If they hear it from town officials, you know, it, it'll have more weight. You can also let them know to watch this meeting on YouTube, Joel, once it's posted. <laughs> they, they could be watching it. <laughs> yeah. well, well, we look forward to, to have them, having them over the neighborhood. We just want to make sure uh, we do our best to have a good project there. And I know it's what Mr. McPartland and the board wants. So Great. All right. Um, all right. So we'll have a tentative resolution. And... Uh, uh, for the next meeting and we'll get that out and make sure we're all happy with the conditions so on and so forth okay thanks right. everyone yeah thank you and thank you mr McFarland. and thank you joel bye all right next is 398 anthony street site plan review of a major accessory structure and that's a carport and i'll uh, just turn this over to mr laflamme who's the project lead on this so this can you guys hear me yes so this was a project that we reviewed a few weeks ago, and it was approved based on our understanding of the height of the um, carport or truck port assembly. And I believe it was during the permit review process, the inspector actually went out and looked at the structure, better understood how the height or the peak of the structure might exceed our, our, our limit of 15 feet. It, 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 it turns out to be a measurement calculated based on the grade and such to be uh, six feet and at six inches higher. Than our requirement requires a variance. So, so this is a review of the height variance that would be required for this structure that hasn't changed, but I think it was a misunderstanding of what the actual peak height would be. Um, and that's basically it. I mean, I, I would recommend that we that we accept or approve and move to the the zoning board for approval of this high variance. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Lafana. I know that we have the applicant, uh, Ms. Gagnon, and, and we just on online. The Gagnon's online, so thank you. Um, uh, does anybody on the, you know, I, I know we've received the packet. Does everybody understand what happened here? And obviously, there was a picked up by the, I believe, the building inspector during the permitting process at the elevation, um, you know, was basically not as we all expected and po possibly also the opposite of what they expected. Uh, as you all know, we had a lot of questions about the height because we, you know, we run into this and we were concerned about whether, you know, the last conversation we had, whether it was going to be adequate. And, uh, you know, obviously we thought it was adequate until it was identified that the peak of it is uh, six foot six inches above um, required uh, structure. Is there anything, Ms. Gagnon, that you'd like to add to that? 
No, just I, when I originally sent in the plans and what they sent me, it all said 14 feet and I'd gone over it with um, Mr. Henry and what it looked like to me was 14 feet. I didn't take into account, there's a little triangle in the corner of the plans and I didn't realize that that meant that it was going to go up. So mm -hmm. that was my mistake. But that being said, when I talked to the company about it, it has to be at that pitch for snow and wind and the whole thing for the Northeast. Like we were in a certain zone, so it has to be at a certain pitch to withstand the snow, the weight, the pounds per square foot or square inch. I think it's square foot. And so with all that, it had to be set like that. And we had to have it at a certain height because our trucks are standard height for the industry. So that's what our trucks are. So in order to have it high enough for us to get our trucks in, then we had to have the pitch at that. You know, if we lived in the South, we wouldn't even need a pitch, right. but it's because of the snow and the wind and stuff. Yeah, and obviously if we knew about it, and if you knew about it, we would have taken mm -hmm. action, you know, during the process. Yeah, last I'm year. sorry, I just so didn't know how to do that. Back again. So, yeah. um, so, what we, so what we got is we're gonna need to have another resolution. Got a little bit of feedback there, maybe Ms. Gagna, maybe you could uh, mute yourself while we're, I think it might be you. Um, so what we've got is, uh, I guess, a start over to some degree, um, and uh, we have to make a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals about the height variance. Now we have this meeting, the next meeting, and actually th third, three meetings before the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, which is at the end of February. I think it's like the 24th or 25th, 24th, floor. So it's somewhere right in there. Obviously, we don't want to wait to the last meeting prior to the Zoning Board of Appeals because that doesn't give the town planning department, uh, planning and zoning, much time to notice everybody. So we need to make a recommendation tonight or at our next meeting uh, for the Zoning Board of Appeals so that the town can execute that paperwork and the notices that go along with it, okay? So Mr. Lafon, if you're okay, we can we can take action on the recommendation tonight if you're ready to do that. And that'll be one less thing that we have to do. <clears throat> the, um, well, let's let's just to see if there's any any additional concerns. I know several of us have been down there and have been become familiar with you know Anthony Street. It's very commercial. There's a lot of other structures across the street of different heights. Um, the, I can say that this applicant has significantly improved that area that they've been in over the past two years that they've been there or so, year and a half. Um, and I don't believe looking west, any especially when there's any foliage, the height difference would be visible by by anyone, be rather insignificant. And then looking, you know, to the, I guess it's to the east, but the commercial buildings on the other side of Anthony Street, looking toward um, the business, Robin's business, they'll see something a little higher, but it's not, it's not any different than that area has to offer today with structures and such. So, if anyone else has any comments or concerns, this would be a good time to maybe, you know, kick it around. As Chairman mentioned, we have a couple of weeks before uh, the zoning board meeting. Yep. You know, open it. You know, if anybody has any concerns or thoughts on this, um, I mean, I'm okay with moving forward, making a recommendation tonight because we can discuss all those attributes that you just talked about, Mr. Laflam. You know, positive or negative, uh, in part of our recommendation, which will be documented. I did get an opportunity to go down there today and, and drive around, um, check things out. Um, I agree with Mr. Laflam. Okay. All right, I'll tell you what, since I don't, I don't hear any comments, so please interrupt me if I'm if I'm pulling the trigger too fast. If not, no, I'm just going to ask the three, three questions and we'll fill in the blanks to be able to support our recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals if everybody's okay with that. All right. So the first question is uh, effect on the comprehensive plan. Um, Mr. Laflam, where do you stand on that? Those recommendations? I don't believe there'd be any effect on the comprehensive plan. All right, so the recommendation, Mr. Laflamme, is that there is no effect on the comprehensive plan. Comments uh, from the board on that? Okay. Um, I mean, it's a zone general industrial, right, uh, district. Uh, any changes there, unless they were going to impact uh, anything in the comprehensive plan, and I don't believe that this does. So all those uh, favor that there's no impact on the comprehensive plan signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Is anyone opposed? Okay, hearing no one opposed, uh, there is no effect, uh, a recommendation there's no effect on the comprehensive plan. Next item is suitability for use in the area proposed. 
uh, Mr. Oflam, a recommendation on suitability? Based on the zoning that you just described in, in, in the expectation that there will need to be structures like this, I, I do think I think it's in it's in it's in kind with with the suitability. Okay, so it's suitable for the area, uh, suitable of use for the area proposed, um, and we'll need to back that up with some information for the. Uh, um, so I'll make some suggestions if you, you know, to help you out, Mr. Flam, unless you have some specific ones. But I think you, you hit it. Uh, the zoning district, you know, is a IG zone, so it's appropriate based on the businesses that are down there. Um, I also, you know, made some notes here. I thought that would help, and I'll give these, Laura, to you. I can also send it to you or type it up, okay? Um, it would help organize, clean up the property. Uh, as the applicant has stated in previous meetings, you know, um, you know, it's a benefit to uh, put the, the, the vehicles, and they could be loaded at night uh, inside, and I think that will also benefit because now they're indoors versus sitting outside from the aesthetics uh, standpoint. Um, it also uh, would prevent... Um, uh, prevent a, a potential wastage and encourage recycling. Um, as noted by the applicant during our discussions previously, if this uh, material gets wet, uh, it may, may have no value and end up in the uh, uh, refuse, right, or trash. And by uh, having this structure, uh, it would encourage uh, uh, the potential and, and give a stronger opportunity for recycling. Um, the other things that I noted that I went down there today is that it kind of fits with the current building. The facade of that building is pretty high. I know it doesn't, looks like it doesn't exceed the 35 foot uh, level or requirement for 35 foot structure. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is high. So the aspect ratio between the proposal and the building seems like it fits. So um, so I said, so I think that's encouraging. In other, in other words, if the existing building was, you know, a 10 foot high structure, flat, flat roof, it might look out of place, but I don't think that's the situation. And I believe it would have little to no impact on the surrounding um, uh, businesses or residences uh, uh, in the, um, that are nearby, which is up the road a bit. Um, so that's that's my thoughts. Does anybody else have anything else that I may have missed regarding suitability? No, no I think you covered all the ones that I recall being the benefits of the applicants. Okay. Need. All right, so all those in favor, based on the, uh, those comments from Mr. O'Flam and myself regarding suitability of use, uh, it's suitable. Um, um, and all those signify by agreements, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, is anyone opposed? Okay, hearing none opposed, then we'll state that it's suitable for use in the area which is proposed. And the recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Mr. O'Flam? Uh, to approve the hearing. Yeah. Recommendation the Zoning Board of Appeals approve the uh, area variance for the height of the structure. All those uh, that are in agreement signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. So I hear none opposed. So um, we have a positive recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Planning Department will put that get together and pass that on to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I will uh, type up my notes, Laura, tomorrow. You give me a chance and I'll send that to you to help out, okay? Um, uh, so that'll, you know, again, that's the Zoning Board Appeals. Uh, they have the authority to do as they wish. Uh, this is only a recommendation to them. Uh, and, you know, it'll be up to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the next uh, topic that we could talk about is a, a resolution. Now, we could wait till to see what the Zoning Board of Appeals does, and then it would be our next meeting wouldn't be, wouldn't be till March, I believe, the first meeting after the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we have the potential here, um, based on discussions with Mr. Ophalm and, and the planning department, to um, have a resolution drafted for our next meeting, contingent on the approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals, so that way that uh, we could, uh, you know, minimize the number of meetings and paperwork for everybody. Um, is everybody okay with that? Mr. Ophalm, are you okay with that? I am. Okay. I, I think that makes sense because you know next time all we do is say yeah they approved or disapproved it they disapprove it it's not going Thank forward you. anyway so we can have the resolution uh, drafted contingent upon the approval uh, and that won't change anything that we say to the zoning board of appeals or a recommendation totally separate uh, but we can have that resolution if everybody looks like they're okay with that anybody opposed I don't see anybody opposed okay Laura and Mr Henry if you, have, you can work on that resolution for the next meeting also and uh, along with the recommendation, right? You know, hopefully minimize um, 
or interactions. Not that we don't enjoy the interactions, of course. You know. All right. Anything else, the applicant? Anything? No. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. And anything else from the board? No? Okay. Thank you, everybody. And uh, that closes uh, um, 398 Anthony Street for tonight. Then. All right. Next, we have 2456 Hilltop Road, and that's a sketch plan application for two lot, two lot minor subdivision that we've been uh, discussing, uh, at least at the last meeting. And Mr. Laflamme is also the project lead for that. Um, so Mr. Laflamme, I'll turn that over to you because maybe you or, and then you can ask Mr. Henry to help out to summarize uh, any analysis and looking at the, uh, the lots in those areas, okay? So I don't know if Mr. Laflamme, you want to start? Yeah, I just can't seem to get to my mute button. And we do have, let's see, the, the applicant is responsible. Is that his name? Is he online tonight? Or, or a representative of the applicant, Mr. Ingalls, I believe? Yes, hi, this is Dave Ingalls. I okay. saw my name on the plan, so I thought I would uh, take part tonight. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, okay Chris. So the applicant has submitted a request for just for a minor subdivision of this plot of land. It's pretty sizable uh, on Hilltop. Um, it would it it would meet some aspects of the of our code, but not others with setbacks and overall square footage for the neighborhood. So so we had done we had done some analysis and really this is just a discussion for all of us to kick around concerns and ideas and um, and such it, it, it there was some confusion that the lot was potentially two lots and it is a single lot um, and it does not meet the, the setback and offset requirements that the town has um, and that's that's where that's where we're at right now um, there were some documents added some um, examples given of the hilltop area lot area frontage comparison. Um, and there were probably, I think, 17 properties looked at as comparables to see if um, the square footage proposed in the applicant's um, diagram or design uh, would would fall within the range of the other properties in, in the adjacent neighborhood or the neighborhood or lands surrounding the property. Um, and there was some pretty good data points added um, the last two pages of the document where, where um, Clark indicated lot size comparison and frontage size comparison. And frontage 100, 100 feet linear on hill, hilltop would be acceptable. And there's several properties that 11 of the 25 um, would, would be similar to that lot frontage. But in terms of the square footage of the lot size as a whole, if the subdivision were to be approved, the square footage would fall to an amount that's actually not paralleled by any other houses in the neighborhood. So it would actually take a lot size that is above average, but somewhat average, certainly meeting setbacks and offsets and creating two lots that would be the smaller on the smaller end for sure. There are two other properties that are on Hilltop that are somewhat similar within, let's say, a 10% margin of those proposed two new lots. Um, but they actually have arisen some additional data points that I've noticed and Kevin and I've talked about, which we'll talk about you know, in a little bit. Um, so so Kevin, I, I don't I just want to have an open discussion of what other questions or maybe even concerns that were concerns within the data that was presented in our packets um, yeah. uh, amongst amongst the group and and see what what additional thoughts or ideas or uh, considerations may come from the the board. Yep, and and uh, before we do that, I just uh, I just pulling up the data here, um, taking a look at it. Uh, for the applicant, or Mr. Ingalls, uh, if you haven't seen the data, it's on the web page uh, for the planning board um, packet for tonight. It's the last pages in the packet. Um, uh, so at the last board when we a meeting, we discussed this. Obviously, there was uh, lots of discussion on whether it was one lot or two. Well, that was put to rest because it's one lot. Uh, but, you know, but, 
sides playing a part in knowing that and legal also support that. So we're not, uh, there's no, no question that this requires a subdivision um, in order to get another lot. Uh, the subdivision uh, is um, not uh, compliant with the current zoning regulations and area variances would be required in order for that to occur. Specifically, both lots would be non-conforming on their size. And uh, there's a setback concern because the existing garage, uh, three-car garage on the property uh, is uh, too close uh, a side yard for where the property would need to be um, uh, drawn property line in order to maintain the required 100 feet of frontage uh, for the residential lot. So it conflicts with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 you know, obviously it'd be nice if uh, both lots were larger and um, it's just a matter of uh, drawing a line saying, okay, you got two lots and they're conforming, but that's not the situation here. So um, Mr. Laflamme and Mr. Henry from the planning department, uh, based on our conversation last time, went off to take a look at some data because it's always nice to understand what we have over there to uh, help make a decision. And basically the data shows that if this lot, the existing lot, which is about 0.69 acres were subdivided as proposed, uh, we would have two of the smallest lots uh, on Hilltop as a result of that subdivision. Um, there are other uh, pre-existing non-conforming lots that are small, but in reality, they're slightly larger and these two could be the smallest lots uh, in that uh, neighborhood or at least on Hilltop as a result of the subdivision. So that's kind of where we're at. And the board, you know, in, in ask questions here, but the board's action is we have an application for a subdivision, so we have to make a determination on that uh, and include it with that determination and may not have to do that right away. But um, if we give a positive recommendation, we also have to make a recommendation uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which would also have to uh, obviously grant the area variance in order for the subdivision to completely occur. So that's what, kind of where we're at. And um, again, as Chris said, we can open the open it for discussion to the board and what everybody uh, thinks of this application, please. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to just say to uh, Chris and uh, Mr. Henry, I was, I'm really, um, I'm really impressed and just thankful that um, you're able to gather so much hard data and that I think that some of these scattered plots really um, help visualize um, where this would fall um, on paper. Um, one, one um, metric that I don't believe is captured here that I thought might be also helpful in this um, to add some context to this discussion is percent lot coverage. Um, I know that probably is going to be something that has to be an as more of an approximation. Uh, we can't necessarily have hard numbers on that. Um, but I think it would get to the impact on the character of the neighborhood creating um, two small, relatively small lots for the neighborhood on which one existing home um, already sits that's by all outward appearances uh, on the larger end of homes on the block. Um, so that's where I'm kind of coming from in, in thinking that um, if we could have some approximation of lot coverage, um, I think that would provide further context to this discussion of, you know, from a, from a statistical standpoint, whether or not this is a suitable um, variance, suitable use. Okay, thank you, Mr. Martin McPartland. Sure. I think it should be um, pointed out too, just for our reference, the homes on John Paul Court and Heartland um, are zoned R2. So even though they are on the smaller side, they're in a R2 versus the R1 that the homes on Hilltop are zoned for. Great point, Stacey. That's that's something that we need to. It was brought up. We had some we had some comments and letters from neighbors that preceded this discussion on this call. And, um, you know, we haven't had any positive, you know, uh, feedback yet, just just negative, but that wasn't mentioned that letter, but thank you so much for pointing that out. 
it's within the neighborhood, but it isn't the same zoning. Yeah. Um, therefore, the, the the I guess the 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 flavor or the uh, the feel of the street when you're driving down hilltop is different than a cul-de-sac R2. You know, this is an R1, a little more spacious. And something that you just brought up that kind of helped explain something to me is with some of these larger lots, it can happen with any lot. It doesn't matter with the R1 or 2. But there's sometimes more equipment necessary to maintain the land. And maybe you'd have a snowblower or even a riding mower or, or such. And and it was noted as I was looking at some of the street today uh, that the immediate neighbor to this land, again, in this R1 neighborhood, has a shed that looks like it's been there forever. It's fitting with the aesthetic of the building. Um, but uh, those lots that were a little smaller are kind of struggling to fit the things that they choose to have on that land to support the maintenance of the land. So you take two, you know, a nice size lot that is a little bit bigger, but there are three or four that are actually larger than this one. And then you subdivide it into two smallest, and then you now just created four more opportunities for that encroachment. So it's just, it's a good point to point out that R2 versus R1 in this comparison. I, look, I, I do appreciate the analysis and I think it's very informative. And thank you, Chris, from what you did even in a meeting last time to the more accurate representation now, right? But at the end of the day, as a planning board, we shouldn't, you know, when we think about if we were to make a recommendation around this on for the ZBA on this uh, two lot subdivision, we, we, I mean, do we really want to be creating a true nonconformance? Um, you know, wh whether it's the smallest on the, on the, on the street or not, right. It, it's going to be a nonconformance and to all the other points that were made, it, it, it doesn't seem appropriate for that street. And so the thing I'm struggling with actually is legally since the application has been put in front of us, what, what is our obligation here other than to just say, this isn't going to work. So, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I was talking to Laura a bit today about that, you know, process. I guess it's a process question. You know, we got an application for a, uh, um, again, a subdivision, which requires us to grant sketch approval or not to grant sketch approval. If we grant sketch approval, we still have to make a recommendation on whether we agree that the variances are appropriate. So obviously, if we grant sketch approval, it means we're okay with everything, right, including you know, the location of the garage and the size of the lots. Um, so I don't, you know, so we may not get that far at, uh, as a board uh, to make that recommendation if we're not happy with, you know, this as a subdivision to begin with. And I know Laura's got first, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, more details on that, but I also see the applicant may have some uh, comments there. Sir? Sure. Hi, everybody. Good evening. It's Dave Engels. Um, I guess we just wanted to, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or if the board would like to deliberate, deliberate further. We just wanted to uh, see if we could make a few points in support of the application at some point. No, this is a, this is a good time because we're in discussion. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as you stated, the lot is uh, about seven tenths of an acre, 0 0.69. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, quite a bit larger than the other lots along Hilltop. If you look at the exhibit, and I guess backing up for a minute, I would like to thank planning and Clark. I think that I agree with Mr. McParland. It's a great presentation plan and a great inventory of the existing lots. Uh, <clears throat> are the immediate neighbors to 2456, the subject lot uh, going up the road, uh, immediately adjacent is 2464 and 2468. Uh, essentially, 2468 is exactly the same size, uh, 0 0.35 acres. So that's a good comparison of, of our neighbor. So our neighbor would actually be in keeping with the proposal. And 2468 would also be in keeping. And even 2472, which is slightly larger, but those lots are all 100 foot width. So they so in terms of if you if you look at the streetscape and the street view, uh, going down the road, those those next three lots would look exactly the same. 
you would not know the difference if you were walking, driving, uh, biking, or hiking. Uh, the next three lots would be uh, completely in keeping with the proposal to uh, re-subdivide back to the original uh, property line. I know there's been discussion about uh, the lot uh, residing as, an, as a single tax map parcel, which we agree if you go to Skanky County uh, tax mapping, it does show up as one uh, 0.69 acre tax map lot. However, I think the applicant did make a statement at the last meeting that when he did purchase it and his title report and deeds show it as two separate lots, uh, we did confirm that uh, it does actually show up. So there is some validity to what he stated in terms of being two deeds and uh, with also two, two deeds or two, two parcels within his um, title report. So interesting, interesting how, how we're not sure how and when it got, uh, those two original lots got combined. They were actually two lots that were part of the Simmons subdivision. It actually goes way back to 1938 when those original lots were subdivided. So our, our, our point would be that the lots are in keeping, the proposed lots would be in keeping with the streetscape and like you said, most definitely when you go into the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, if you look at the map that Clark put together, uh, we would be well within the median of those neighborhoods, not only the R2, but the R1 areas. If we go over to McGovern and we look at those lots, those lots are actually smaller than the 15,000 square feet. So just like you can make an argument that it may be slightly smaller on Hilltop, we could easily make the argument that it's well within keeping of the overall area uh, of, the, of the subdivision, or excuse me, of the neighborhood <clears throat> from, from all the streets that are uh, exiting off of Van Antwerp. So that would be our point there. So we really don't agree or we don't feel that you would be setting a precedent that these are really could be looked at as lots of record, which is in the zoning as pre-existing non-conforming. Uh, again, that's how they were created and now the applicant is looking to uh, bring those back to the original sub subdivided lots and the original uh, lot lines. If you go to the map that we submitted, it actually shows the original lot line uh, and we would be going back to that original lot line. So again, if we look at the lot immediately behind us, uh, 744, I think that was one of the lots that was mentioned by Mrs. Olson, she's on 740. Uh, on John Paul Court, uh, that lot is is only uh, fourteen thousand square feet. The the one that's immediately behind us, and the one there's some lots in that neighborhood that are only eleven thousand square feet. So that's a quarter acre compared to the proposal for 0.35 acres in, in this subdivision. So again, the the immediately adjacent lot would be exactly the same size we'll say 0 0.35 acres so we would be in keeping with the with the neighborhood there um there was some question about drainage this the subject lot is is actually lower than uh saint john or i keep, keep saying saint john sorry uh john paul court so there there's not any concern for drainage i would like to assure the board of that uh, with a simple grading plan and drainage plan, we could uh, we could work out any of the technical uh, aspects of the project. Uh, there was some discussion about a pipe that drained down the property from one of the adjacent properties. Uh, in terms of putting that into a catch basin and running it down the lot line, I'm sure we could we could make something like that work as well. So, uh, from a technical standpoint, we would be fine. Uh, again, we think it would be a good use to put this back on the tax rolls as, as a, uh, a vacant lot to be appropriately used in the residential zoning. Uh, it, that is a single family zone. Uh, one thing we were talking to the applicant about, uh, maybe, maybe there could be some uh, details or design criteria that would be appropriate. You, talk, you spoke of the architectural review, review board earlier. Uh, I did speak to the applicant. They would be willing 
uh, to work out any of the uh, architectural desires or concerns, if there are any, to be in keeping with the existing neighborhood. And uh, as Mr. McParland stated, I'm sure we could work out the, the lot coverage uh, concerns as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ingalls. Um, sure. Appreciate thank you. It. Um, uh, just for a point of clarification for me, um, since the uh, the data that we have doesn't show the, I believe, unless I'm missing something, doesn't show the uh, uh, zoning line. Is uh, so it's a question for I guess Laura or Mr. Henry. Uh, is it John Paul Court where it backs up? Is that that is R two there? Is that correct? Or is that R one? Yeah, I apologize. I did not catch that. I really appreciate Daisy bringing it up to us. It is not appropriate to compare parcel sizes between R1 and R2 districts because so essentially John Paul Court is R2 and so is Heartland Street. And so their minimum lot size is 900. So these lots are actually over and larger than what they're required to be. <laughs> so I would say that in, in any analysis um, I'm very sorry about not double checking the zoning there. Shouldn't include an alternate zoning. So I would encourage you guys just use the last page, which is only the houses on Hilltop. Um, and we could bring another uh, point to you, but I don't think it's appropriate to compare between zonings because essentially, yes, they're smaller, but they're actually larger than they're, um, you know, supposed to be in an R2 zone. because they, Their minimum is 9,000 and an R1 zone minimum is 18,000. So it's quite a difference. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point, Laura. Uh, that's a great exhibit that you have, though. If you look at twenty four sixty four, that would be the sister lot to the lot that's being proposed. Twenty four, so twenty four sixty four. Yeah, twenty four sixty four. Uh, that's fifteen thousand in change, which would be similar to the fifteen thousand plus lots being proposed. So you could see how the lots would lay in. If you if you just imagine uh, taking 2464 and mirroring it on itself or butterflying it on itself, that would lay in on the vacant portion of uh, 2456. Oops. And if you expand out from there and look at the rest of the neighborhood, you're going to see a lot of lots that are uh, well within keeping with that 15,000 square foot. If we go over to uh, like McGovern and Stanley, uh, those lots are very very small you know, I'm they're about 12,000 square feet but I, I can't uh, Laura you can actually click on those correct yeah I mean we can bring back a plot that has you know a better comparison and stays within the zone in district um but I I definitely wouldn't want to use no no Laura Laura the visual the visual on hilltop so so just you know so I didn't look at the at the John Paul court properties. I'm just looking along Hilltop, so it's the last sheet in the package, right? Yes. And and yes, if you divide 2456 the way it's being proposed, it'll get commensurate. It'll still be smaller, but it'll get commensurate to that adjacent property at 2464, mm -hmm. right? And I think even over 2468. But those, you know, so someone can detail the pre-existing non-conforming you know designation on the spreadsheet here but even so i'm just coming back fundamentally to the planning board's role in recommending a a uh, a you know this big a deviation from the the you know the you know the zoning area and not to mention the setbacks issue too right well set back from the garage i mean right yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a zoning, you know, we have to make a recommendation on if we get that far. And that's a, you know, ZBA. Um, obviously, the ZBA doesn't grant that. I think that would make put us dead in the water, would be my understanding, if we get that far. Um, the one thing and, that, you and, know, and so, go ahead. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Walsh. Go ahead. No, I go ahead, Mr. Khan. I'm okay. No, I, I just, I'm understanding that procedurally we would have to, there needs to be an action on the sketch plan before he can go in front of the ZBA. Is that statement true? Yes, that's my understanding. Yep. But if we're not comfortable with the size of the lots, um, you know, you know, we have to deny sketch plan, you know, and uh, if that's, a, a, you know, I guess we have to document, you know, why, 
I'm going to talk to Laura. Uh, we could do that. And um, I, I, I guess that's the end of the trail. I mean, I don't know what the. Right, but, but once, if we were to deny the sketch plan, then he can proceed to the applicant can proceed to the ZBA, right? I, I don't think so. But I'll uh, leave that to Laura or Mr. Briggs. I, we can double check that because um, we don't run into that situation a whole lot. Either the applicant would understand that, you know, the planning board wasn't willing to consider the subdivision just because the zoning board grants it. And Paul Briggs is still here. Just because the zoning board grants the variance, I think it still doesn't mean that the planning board is required to do the subdivision. But I'd have to double check that because I think you are more restricted once the area variances are lifted. But um, I mean, like, I would, I would. Like if, if if the board is leaning towards they don't want to approve um, the non-conforming lots in this way, like deny sketch plan and then at least be prepared to do a recommendation to the zoning board to not approve the variances. You guys have done that before yeah. um, and allow the applicant to have, you know, the ability to have that be heard out as well. But I will double check the process. It's it's very it's very unclear to me. Yeah, I mean, what I, th is. I mean, I think we all would like to ensure that the applicant has every recourse that 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 he has for for bringing this forward. But you know, th this this does sit at close to one of the extreme ends of you know of 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 it, it, look at look. There are two there are two very non-conforming lots at the extreme end of non-conforming for the R one district. Right, so so I I don't see how as a planning board member, I can and and you know I'm sorry, Ms. Ringles, and your the points you made are very you know very clear, and very um, well taken relative to but again pre-existing, non-conforming lots that have been there, right? Um, so I, I like like I said, I'm 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 just wondering under what justification we can use I as a planning board member can use to say that I'm okay with this sketch plan. Yeah. Right. You know, the thing that too that's interesting is that the um, you know obviously the lots were combined at some point in time. I'm not sure when or how, but it, it was done. So I got one lot. Um, if you know if it wasn't combined, um, then it would be uh, they would have had to get an area variance for the garage, is assuming that that took place during current zoning regulations, right? They would have to get an area variance for the garage, and that might have been granted or denied, whatever. Nonetheless, that house would be the way it is, and we would have a pre-existing non-conforming lot that, uh, if I understand things correctly, uh, would probably just be a building permit, but that's not the case where we're at. If the case we got one lot, it's 0.69 acres, now the applicant is looking to break it apart again. Uh, we, you know, we talked about it last time. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I was a little, I've been driving around, I talked to Mr. LaFlam today, I, I was on the fence, you know, kind of on the fence because, hey, it's got 100 linear feet, and I believe that's 100 linear feet are requirements for the R1, so it does meet that requirement. So. I, I don't personally. I don't feel so bad about the 100 feet. That's not 120 or greater. It meets the requirement on the front, right? The real right. question for me is two things: Is it okay to approve a non-conforming lot um, uh, of you know it's basically 85% of what it should be, and whether or not it sets a precedent? And uh, the, you know that's the conversation we had last board whether to do this and set the precedent because I don't know how many lots are out there in this unit. Uh, you know, uh, maybe there's maybe there's 20 where people would come in and say, hey, I got, you know, 30,000 square foot lot and it's R1. How about I subdivide now to 15,000? Right. And and, and, and and I'm inferring from Mr. Ingalls' statement and from, you know, the applicant's statement in the last meeting that, you, you know, re regardless of whatever checks, et cetera, should have been done, there was some impression that there was two lots there yeah. at some point mm -hmm. in time. Right. So. From my perspective, having a hearing with the having a hearing with the ZBA, right? I would I I would support that, but I can't support that in the context of approving a sketch plan that I don't I believe is not approvable and making a recommendation to the ZBA to approve those area variances that are right. So if there is a way we could deny the sketch plan, make negative recommendations to the ZBA, and still have the applicant be able to go see the ZBA. That sounds like it's the you know it's the it's it's the most fair option. Yeah, again, I won't speak for Mr. Briggs, but how could you go to the ZBA and look for an area variance when it's all one lot? 
you know there's no there is no deviation you know if if if, if we don't grant sketch I, approval I, I i understand the i understand the you know, you know the, the, the nuance of that one but it's it then i'm just pointing to the fact that you know the applicant seems to have been under the impression there were two lots there at some point i think so, that determination well that determination has been made it's one lot right. that's what we're dealing with yeah i think uh just just to chime in real quick uh with uh with that the the applicant definitely thought it was uh whether whether correct or incorrect uh the applicant did purchase the the lot as two lots uh as they were listed in the deeds i don't know if the deeds and the title report were submitted with the application but it does clearly show uh two parcels uh so yeah we don't we don't I could not find any record uh, exactly when or how they they got combined to a single tax map parcel. So that would definitely be we would really appreciate the base that being a basis for a hardship and supporting the variance application most definitely with the ZBA as Mr. Khan said. So um, we definitely would like the relief of being able to go in front of the ZBA and let them hear the case. And explain, you know, the applicant could explain exactly that. Uh, they do meet the 100 foot frontage requirements. And our interpretation or our, our opinion is if you drive down Hilltop, you're not going to know whether those lots are 15,000 plus or 18,000. Because really, what happens when you look at the uh, presentation map off the tax map? Hilltop Road actually varies uh, or veers away from the rear property line. So those next three lots, they're all 100 foot wide. You, you don't know what the area is. They could be 15,000 or they could be 30,000 uh, because really they're gaining their area with depth away from the road. And it's very subtle. Uh, the next lot only being a few hundred square feet larger. So I think we have a very good case to... I guess the question is, is right. How do we get to the, to the ZBA? Yep. And, I, and I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure what the concern is of the planning board in terms of setting a precedent. If we use the, the argument that there was a hardship upon purchase, uh, which would be the yeah. argument we also use with the ZBA. And yeah, we don't, we don't use that argument, Mr. Ingalls. Yeah. That's not a suitable. Uh, yeah, that's not an argument for us. That's the, we go, we go by the code. No, I understand. I understand. So what is, the, what is the concern? The concern would be the area, just just a just a, a straight up mathematical concern. Well, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. Does the current code require requirement as it sits today? In other words, yeah. Well, for for me, it's it, you know, um, if the lots were slight, for me, it's these two lots. If it were to be subdivided are the smallest based on that data that we have in front of us, correct? And I know they're close to them, yeah. but they are the smallest. Is that what we want to do? We want to encourage, you know, if, if it fell, you know, larger than a couple of the lots, I'd probably be sitting here saying, hey, it's bigger than a couple of the lots after you subdivide the 15, and it makes sense you get the 100 foot of front, but that's not the case, it's the smallest lots. And that might make a difference for this board in making their decision on whether we grant sketch plan approval or not. Um, and then, then, you know, talking to Laura, then we got to look at options. Is there anything feedback that we can give you that would um, make it possible? Uh, and the, the problem is these lots are confined. There's like no options. Like we've seen in the past, as you know, Mr. Ingalls has been in the business. It isn't like you can go to a neighbor and say, you know, buy, uh, you know, so many square feet. Well, maybe you can because, uh, you know, off of John Paul Court, because those lots are, if they're 9,000 square feet in the, uh, res, you know, R2 zoning district, do they want to give up some of their property and still have a conforming lot to make yours conforming? Um, uh, you know, that's 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 what I said. Be the only option, you know, that I could see. There's not there's not uh, a lot of options to try to help out either, you know. Um, and, and we unfortunately, Mr. Ingalls, the, the property that you referred to several times as you're gri driving down Hilltop, I think it was um, 2464. You've probably looked at it, but if you look at that property from the street to the right, there's the shed, you know, and that and that that property might wish they could buy some of, you know, the uh, 24 or the, the I guess the 
is facing property that you're subdividing or proposing to subdivide. So I'm just saying that it, it, the precedence is one thing, but even in the specificity of, of that location, it's going to immediately create density and proximity issues. Specific to that site. Well, I think we could definitely lay out a plan that would meet all the required setbacks for a proposed structure. And again, we would be willing to come in if there's any specific architectural details or architectural review, we would be glad to, to work with the review board. So, so the new structure setbacks would be good, but the pre-existing, there's no design changes for the pre-existing home, right? Correct. That would, we would still, re, we're, we're thinking we, to make this lot back to the original lot line and create the, essentially the two equal lots, uh, we would still require that sideline variance of, uh, from 7.2 feet versus 20 feet. Yeah. But again, we could, we, could, uh, we could enlarge the side step back a little bit on, on the newly created lot, uh, lot five, uh, if that would help too, just to make it appear because obviously no one knows where the property lines are uh, in the field. So we, we could we could put the house on lot five, we could move it slightly more from the garage if that was something that was architecturally pleasing. I mean, so, even, so move it even closer to the existing 2464? Whichever, well, we could move it that way or we could, or we could still just keep the 10, the, uh, the set, what is it, a 10 foot setback or 20 foot, a 20, excuse me, a 20 foot setback right. uh, to the new property line. We could do it either way. Uh, we, we, you, you I, tell think, I think we have to be careful about this, you know, managing around um, this, the creation of a variance with this action, because um, we have to keep in mind too, you know, part of the reason we, we, make a recommendation to the ZBA and consider the effect on the comprehensive plan, the suitability of the uses. Um, the, the yard exists now as, as a nice place for Mr. Sponable or any future homeowner to in, enjoy, enjoy that area, in, install accessory structures and so on. And um, any future homeowner of a, of a subdivided parcel has that expectation as well. And um, it's not outside the realm of possibility that uh, were this proposed lot to be um, constructed at 15,000 square feet, uh, a future homeowner might want to install a fence or make an addition. And they could make the argument that their house is the smallest house on the block and their neighbor has a shed right next to the property line. And so now I'd like one. And all of a sudden we're just we're we're cramming even more larger of a, of a square peg and a round hole here. Um, that's kind of how I'm at this. I know Jengis mentioned we kind of have to look at procedurally and how can we make a, a recommendation to the ZBA uh, without granting sketch plan approval, but how can we grant sketch plan approval if we know that our recommendation to the ZBA will be a negative one? That's, the, that's what the, I'm... The, that's that's right. Then. Right, and Patrick, just to, just to build on everything you've said, at the end of the day, this subdivision changes this density from R1, period. And actually makes it excruciatingly away from R1. I mean, you could see it in the, you could see it looking at the satellite images on those properties, right? I think Chris, you or maybe Chairman Walsh had mentioned earlier, those, those smaller properties that are pre-existing non-conformance, they're very tight. They're tight for that area, right? And that's what we're trying to focus on is we don't want to disrupt we don't want to disrupt that neighborhood's um, aesthetic, spacing, feel. You know, the, the recent subdivision that occurred across the street maintained that expectation and it feels natural. But it it, it doesn't well, see it, the numbers are not natural. That's the, that's you know, you make a great point, Mr. Ingalls. The depth of the of the of the yards are what make that that square footage work. Right, uh, the, the the linear frontage is the same, but we're looking at the square footage. To Jengis's point, there's certain expectations to do small expansions and get permits, and you know, um, and that's a ch that's a challenge when you have these um, non-conforming lots. I I guess we we when we looked at this, we weren't just focusing on the the immediate neighbor of of Hilltop, 
But but again, if we were, I still would go back to my argument of 2464 and 2468. They're 15,000 square foot plus. They're, they're, they're very similar to what's being proposed. Uh, but if we expand out to the rest of the neighborhood, to McGovern and Stanley, you're using the argument that all, all of these lots are tight to begin with, then, then all of the lots in the neighborhood would be tight. Uh, if we look at the aerials for Stanley, Wemple, and McGovern, those are not big lots and, and they're not even as deep as the proposed lots. So how are all those lots functioning as viable R2 or R1 building lots? Mm -hmm. But the point, the problem with that uh, argument is that they are, you know, pre-existing non-conforming R1, and rec you know, the request here is to create more of those, you know, that have the problem, and, that, and that's that's kind of where I think we're hung up. But, sure, you know, we, we we appreciate that, but we're looking at it from being in the character of the neighborhood. So the character, some of the character of the neighborhood is existing lots of record or previously non-conforming lots. So that is part of the neighborhood as well. So, so we're looking to fit in with the neighborhood. So if it happens to be existing lots of record or non-conforming lots, that that's okay. We still could be in keeping with them. Right. But, but we're not going to, you're, you're asking the planning board to create a non-conformance. Understood. By, by approving guess, the schedule. Let, me, let me, let me ask this question. And again, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm trying to, to, yeah, to no, 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 we're good. Let's have make our point. As frankly, as we need to, please. So, I guess the question I would ask then: How would you ever get a variant for uh, what's being proposed for a hundred foot wide lot and an area of slightly over fifteen thousand square foot? How would you get that variance? What would be the procedure? Yeah. Has it been done? <laughs> well, that, Mr. Ingalls, that's a good question because that's exactly what I was going to ask and how uh, Mr. Briggs or Laura, because uh, we're kind of like, uh, you know, which comes first here, to, you know, because uh, I think the zone, and you know, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Zoning Board of Appeals has like uh, the powers to like make determinations on zoning, right, or issues, right? Yes. So even if the planning board said, uh, if the planning board said that, you know, we don't like the sketch plan and to boot, you know, it's non-conforming. The lots are, you know, 85% or 84% of what they should be, right? Forget that, the garage, just for now. Just Let's just talk about the lot size. You take it to the Zoning Board of Appeals, you got to convince them that it's in keeping with the neighborhood and you meet all the requirements to be able for the, uh, and convince the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant, grant you an area variance for this. Say they grant you the area variance. Well, is that, is that the, you know, I guess that's a question for Mr. Briggs. Is that how the process works? Now it doesn't make a difference uh, for sketch plan, you know, you got a uh, you got area variances in place, so therefore the planning department or the planning board basically just has to complete the subdivision process, and we have no say. Um, I guess the only say we would have is when we make our recommendation to the zoning board of appeals. If we if we don't like this proposal, our recommendation would be a negative recommendation that it's not in keeping with the neighborhood, that's not suitable for the area proposed, and we recommend that they don't, you know, and then you're going to argue why we're wrong, you know. So, so I understand, uh, you know, it makes sense to get you in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals, I guess, uh, but I would defer to Laura or Mr. Briggs if, if, if that's what we need to do here. Thank you. Or anybody else that has some input on I mean, we can double check that. I think that, you know, whether it be a resolution denying sketch plan with the issues and then a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals or just a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals, I think the applicant almost always at least has that option, you know, to appeal a decision that's been made there. Um, I'll just double check with him. But I just like just really quickly, like not um, to get to Mr. McParland's point, I think what he was trying to speak about the um, impervious area versus on the other lots when you're doing a comparison. Like this home is 2,996 square feet and it has an 851 foot attached garage. And then the, the close one that is directly adjacent, the 2426, um, is a 2,547 square foot home with no, with no garage. Like Chris, I think said there's a little shed in the back. And then the one, the other one that's small, is 2,000 square 
16 square feet and it has a 484 foot attached garage. So um, the building on this lot is quite a bit bigger than the, than the other smaller lots for context, which mm -hmm. probably would have been different if it had been built on the, and, I, and also like, when you look at the original deed for the subdivision, it's so old, like you can't bring it up online. It's in like book 584, but it has always been one deed. So I think that it never was like, a you know, the house was built on both parcels. It has always been a single deed parcel. I think if you look at it, it's never had two separate deeds. It's always been one since the home was built. And you look at the original deed, which is so old that you can't find it online. Can I can I share the original subdivision with you, Laura? Yeah, I can bring it up as well. There's no question. The original subdivision shows lot four and five, but but and Paul Briggs was trying to explain this to um, Kevin when he was at the meeting the last time. Um, uh, it, you said the lot, the the home was built on both lots. The house was only built on one of the original parcels. Well, lot yes, but, but the deed for the house there's never been two deeds it's always been a single deed if you look at it it's always been one tax parcel id number and a single deed always uh, i believe the applicant has two deed descriptions and two parcel descriptions and that's the way he received title yeah but this is what paul briggs was explaining schenectady is notorious for it you can have and my deed has this you can have multiple parcels in a single deed in a single lot they just do that like we have these um subdivisions in like over on rosa road where the parcels mm -hmm. are 20 feet wide like homes aren't built on these 20 foot wide parcels and you can look at these deeds and you've got like six parcels written into the deed and the homes written across like five or six parcels. I'm sure you've seen this. Like it's yeah, yes, but typically they're dashed or they're grayscale. Uh, typically they don't show as separate parcels. They show as one parcel with very light lines. Can I share a map with the board just so you guys can see it? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to share a screen? Yeah, you can hit the present now button if you kind of like hover your... Um, yeah, it's not on the bottom part. Right. Wait, let me see what happens. I'm I'm used to using Teams. Let's see what we have here. So hit present now, mm -hmm. then your entire screen, and then make sure that you select your screen because share will be grayed out until you actually select that screen that you're sharing. There you go. You got it. So this is the original. Just just for presentation purposes, this is this is the original map right here that was filed. This created uh, parcels four and five. These are our two infamous parcels right here. Uh, 145 feet deep by 100. That was what sh was shown on this map here. And then they start getting bigger as we go up the street. And this is what I was trying to say. Essentially, these parcels were all the same here. One, two, th uh, basically three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The intent was that these were all 100 feet wide. And the road, for some reason, tapers away from this back lot line here, where my cursor is. So that's really the only difference in these lots. Uh, this little bit of extra depth and a few uh, a thousand square feet of area isn't really doing anything from the utility of the lot in terms of being able to put a bigger house or a uh, much bigger yard area. It's purely just a mathematical calculation. So. So the question of the day is, if we knew, is how did we go from this map signed by the city engineer in 1945 and a title report that actually shows these as two separate parcels to the county having a single tax map? But I think we're past that, but I just wanted to show you yeah. how we, we are really in keeping with, with all these lots. We were saying we can't go past Hilltop, uh, but even on Hilltop, I don't. I don't see a big difference in in these lots. Dave, can, Dave, can you can you zoom in on what the square? F oh, sorry. I oh. just I just want to clarify this point because I feel like it's confusing and it's come up a couple times, and it's extremely typical of what you see in Schenectady. Like I just scrolled over to Rosa Road and I just mm -hmm. click on any of these parcels here, and I can bring up and I can do this throughout town. And this will bring up the map for Rosa Road. And these are not dotted or dashed in any way. And all of these homes sit across four or five of these lots. Very normal. I can click on another, like, 
you um I can click on like a, another subdivision where like that is it's very typical like this one like over here like these guys are going to be like 1900 1910 these guys are all like if you look at them and you look at their deed descriptions they built these houses on parcel 215 217 216 217 and that became the lot for that house 218 219 222 and that became the lot for that house it's very typical it's i sure i, no, I, was, re I was referring to the actual that. tax map law when you go to the tax map if you look at the image map, map there, it will show all those lots lighter. But uh, Mr. Ingalls, even that map that you showed us, the property to the west looks like it was enlarged and the properties that are, were in Van Antwerp were made to fit the R1 zoning. You know, So even that map that you show shows that things conformed toward some of some of these here were re, re subdivided. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and the, the remaining lots that were not as deep, the two the lot that you have that's not as deep had the benefit of its width. But the other ones were changed to conform. And the ones that were to the east were actually a little bit bigger because to your point, they got a little deeper. So you bring up it, you know, but again, it's all irrelevant because those are old maps and you know it is common knowledge that those that those exist and it's unfortunate buyers beware that is very unfortunate and of course i'll give you the fact that when i drove down i drive down all the time hillside uh, you know a year ago couldn't really tell the second lot was there it was a nice lot just big now right. you drive by it looks like there's a house missing you know so I, I think that visual is compelling but it's the math and the zoning that we're bound to you know follow yeah, I think we have a, a you know a counter argument or counter opinion that we really don't think he would be setting a precedent by going back to existing lots of record and that they are suitable lots and that easily we could lay a house out on that lot and hmm. no one would be the wiser in the neighborhood. It would be a new neighbor. Yeah. What this what this unique configuration would actually lend itself to, but our current zoning doesn't allow it would be a detached accessory dwelling unit which would make lots four and five not subdivide but would keep um would keep that as one single lot and a perfect example is is that you have the main house that's there a new structure would be built somewhat smaller in size maybe not with a garage and it would be aesthetically the same uh, look as the original dwelling and maybe a mother-in-law apartment, or it would be on the property for you know a newly graduate or somebody from the house. It's not something that would be rented. Uh, it have it would have to stay on on the property. And unfortunately, our code doesn't allow that. But this would be a perfect example of the type of property that could be, if yeah. ever down you know the road, this detached accessory dwelling units became something that the town would want to look into. I think currently, um, Mr. Henry uh, did some legwork for me because I've had a bunch of questions from residents in the neighborhood ask me questions about this, is that I think um, accessory dwelling units are the only thing that's allowed in certain zoning. But just this is what I've been looking at the past week um, since the last planning board meeting and, and thinking that, you know, and I, I agree with Mr. McPartland and Mr. Kahn's comments about the precedents that it would set as far as, you know, how many things are you going to try to get onto a lot, especially if people want accessory structures, garages, perhaps a pool, things like that. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to add, you know, just listening to this conversation too, you know, one of the things I uh, talked a lot about if we were to deny, you know, what other options are out there for this lot, right? To, to try to help. Right. And so uh, Mr. Diarpino just, you know, mentioned one, uh, that may not be op an option because of our code, but we, we talked about earlier, you know, if you could increase the size, so if you could come up with some land. So if John Paul Court is uh, R2 and they got a deep lot, and if they want to sell land to make this, um, um, you know, come conf conforming, that would be an option. Um, another one. Would yeah, I don't, I don't think that would be doable because you can see lot four, that house is probably, that house is probably only 30 feet from the rear property line. They, they barely have a rear yard. 
Yeah. So you're saying it's close to this? This is their house right here. This is, this is their deck. Probably comes within 15 feet of, 15 or 20 feet of the rear line. Yeah, I didn't so, know if you do the analysis. I'm just stating that if it was a potential, right? Um, the other thing is that you know you sell, you know, you know the applicant, you know, if it's if it's a financial, could sell part of the lot uh, because it is 0.69 acres, and maybe the neighbor would be like I think Mr. Laflamme or somebody mentioned that. Uh, I'm not sure who, but you know the neighbor could. Kearney, Kearney. Yeah, hey, maybe they want to pick up a quarter of an acre or whatever and maybe put a detached garage if they don't have one or something up, you know, so that would be an opportunity to recoup finances, you know, if we're trying to help here, right? And the other one would be, you know, you got, again, it's a 0.69 acre lot. It's a beautiful house when he gets done with it. It's got a nice three-car garage, which I always like personally. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's it lends, you know, the, the, the side yard, which is a nice size side yard, uh, if they want to put in a built-in pool, they have that luxury. So in other words, uh, the house could be sold as it is and just it would be more expensive because of the opportunities that it has because of the larger lot on the side. As, I'm just throwing those out as different options. Sure. No, we, we appreciate that. I think I think the applicant would like to pursue the variance route because I, I think he does have a hardship and, and I think that's his, his feeling and that's why we put in the application. Uh, is Mr. Briggs on to give us any commentary if we could? Proceed to the ZBA. Is there is there a, a, a means or a method to do that? I mean, I feel like if if he's not on, we've gotten good direction from the board, Mr. Engel. So we could certainly um, outline your next steps, and then we'll get back to you as soon as we can, and also the board on that. I mean, I think that like you're hearing, um, if we need to draft a sketch plan denial, of, it would probably be a sketch plan denial based on this conversation. I'm just summarizing what I heard from the board. Um, and then potentially you could appeal that or um, it might just be a direct appeal. So that'd be something that I can work on yeah, with we, the legal department. And then I can get the formal sex back to both you and the planning board. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Exactly. Because, you know, you know you're hearing negativity from the board, I guess I'll be blunt, right? About sure. the incident and everything. But an option would be, like Laura says, if we if we deny a sketch plan and make a recommendation to the ZBA, which may be a negative recommendation, at least to get you in front of the uh, ZBA and you have your day, you know, to, to state, you know, if we all don't agree, you know, and uh, I know I'd be glad that let you have that opportunity. I think that's that's valid, you know, and I think the board would agree with that. The question would be then, if the ZBA grants the variances. Uh, you know, I guess we're, we're, you know, does that, I guess that means the subdivision has to be approved. You got now area variances in place. And uh, even though you have a non-conforming lot, they made it conforming by granting the area variance, right? So, so, I so guess Kevin, to be clear, I think that puts it on the same playing field as reviewing other subdivisions, right? So like right now, if there's a subdivision as of right, you have to look at certain criteria and, and that, it, you know, that look that includes drainage and topography and utilities and all of those things. Um, but, you know, there's sort of a subdivision as of right. If this one right now doesn't have a subdivision as of right because it needs area variances. Um, so if the zoning board granted the area variances, it doesn't mean that you would have to approve it, but it would put it on the same playing field as a subdivision that would have met all of the existing setbacks. You would still have the right to review drainage. And I think you heard that tonight, Mr. Engels, like there's some concerns with drainage. And I think you mentioned that you feel that it is an engineering hurdle that could be overcome. Yeah. But I think, that, you know, the planning board would definitely look very, very tightly at drainage because we know drainage in that area is a big issue. And then, um, you know, you would be able to also look at the other factors that you look at for um, subdivision. So it wouldn't mean that you'd all automatically have to approve it, but you would, it would mean that you were looking at it as, you know, in the context of you would look, you know, any normal subdivision as of right. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Excellent. And, and of course, as we talked about the architectural review board, if we were to go that far, is integral to making sure that any uh, structure that's put there kind of flows with the neighborhood. And that's what we, you know, the neighbors expect that and, and we do all sure. stuff. So one of the things that we got in our advantage, at least, in, which, you know, is a uh, schedule because uh, the zoning board doesn't meet until I believe we, we talked about earlier, the 24th of February. Uh, and we have uh, uh, two more meetings, but uh, we don't want to wait to the, you know, the last meeting to make our recommendation because I wouldn't have time to make a notice potentially and that would end up pushing it to the March. So we don't. So I think we need to probably 
Is it the next? And then, I'm sorry, I have to jump in here. In order to be on the February meeting, you would have had to submit paperwork by the 15th of January. We had been working with um, with Mrs. Gagnon, so her paperwork was actually in early, but it would we we already have seven meetings and we're ten days past the deadline. So I don't I don't think my staff could squeeze on another case and. Um, it's also like within a certain proximity of Van Antwerp. So I would just have to like, I would have to say that we wouldn't be able to meet the February meeting at this point. We're just too far. Okay. Well, thank you. Because I didn't, didn't know that. Thank you very much. All right. So well, we still need the feedback from the planning department and legal on a course of action in order to get you in front of the ZBA, how we do that. Okay. Mr. Ingalls. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, so we'll just carry this forward to the next meeting and uh, and await some information uh, from the, you know, those departments. Is that reasonable for everybody at this point in time? Yeah, we appreciate everybody's feedback, uh, Mr. Chairman. But I think that's the route we want to take. So if we could, Laura, if you could help us plan on the next, uh, whatever action has to happen at the next planning board meeting with, with legal, uh, whether the board has to give us a sketch denial or, or negative recommendation or whatever, whatever the process may be, we would like to move to the ZBA if possible and, and get in front of the, the, uh, judicial branch, so to speak, so they can make their interpretation of our, of our, uh, requested variant. If that makes yeah. sense, if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. We just, I'm, I know the planning board doesn't schedule the zoning board cases very often, but the zoning board cases have a month long um, because of the process of the way that they do stuff. It is judicial <laughs> and it does take a little while to get on their docket. Okay. Because okay. we, we, you know, again, we, we, I say we, the applicant feels they have a good, good case that they would like to Present and it is a unique set of circumstances that they would like to present to to that uh, zoning board, and that's that's their their role to to hear those cases, I believe. So I think that would be where the applicant needs to end up. That sounds reasonable to me, and uh, we'll get some feedback from again from the planning and legal to understand the uh, the path to get you there. Um, does everybody else uh, have any comments on it? They think that's the right thing to do. I mean, whether or not we Again, deny a sketch plan and deny uh, the area variance as long as they can move forward and be heard, have their day in court, say so, so to say, right? I think that's fair. Yep. Okay. Anything else uh, at this moment on that? Anything else, Mr. Laflam, or anybody from the board? Nothing else. We covered. This was a great discussion. Uh, we got, you know, Mr. Ingles, thank you for the variety of perspectives yeah. that keep us in tune with what. You know the the applicants' needs really are and desires, and you know, it really forces us to think through how would we proceed in this situation within our our jurisdiction. And very mm -hmm. helpful. Good luck. Yep. And as soon as we have something, obviously, we'll make sure the applicant gets the information. Of course. Okay. Okay. Very good. I didn't think the, next, the next one is the hundred lot subdivision that we're bringing in Monday. No, I didn't. <laughs> but they're, they're substandard lots. It's all conforming. There's no drainage issues, right? <laughs> yep. You know, Correct. Kind we like. Correct. All right. All right. Well, thank thank you, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Yes. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Take care. Okay. All right. That's it on Hilltop tonight. I know it's a tough one, to, uh, but I think we made some ground, at least from the discussion standpoint tonight, and uh, we'll we'll keep it moving forward. All right. So that, uh, that closes pretty much that part of the meeting. It just brings us to reports from the planning department. Laura or clerk, COVID-19 update. What's next on the agenda? Um, yeah, I just leave this one on here just in case you guys have any questions about process or procedure, but the town supervisor just extended our emergency order for another 30 days. I would expect um, at least through the end of those 30 days so at least the next two meetings, uh, we would continue to be remote and probably beyond that um until we can make things as safe as possible for both you guys and the public um we're, we're working on steps for that so i'll keep you guys updated but i would just continue to expect the virtual meetings until i'm able to give you more information okay thank you any questions for laura on that i think we all understand where that's at right now and we get a little bit further along probably coming up on a year i think in probably what march sometime right 
Well, I think we actually suspended our meetings in March. I think we had our first one in April. Even though it seems like it's been <laughs> April. Yeah, so time for huh, everybody? Jeez. It was March. Uh, and then March. Clark, maybe Clark can speak this one, 3410 State Street, the Serafini, Serafini update. Um, Henry? Yeah, sure. Just very quickly, um, Mr. Darpino and I talked. We just wanted to check in. If you remember, this had a six-month milestone, which would be in March. This is for the uh, portable um, storage storage uh, container on 3410 State Street. So just we're just keeping our eyes on that March six-month milestone. So we reached out to Mr. Serafini. He's indicated that he is working with his architect. Um, he has some preliminary sketches. And within the next week or two, he should have some slightly firmed up sketches. So they are working on it. We reminded him of the six month deadline and to make sure that he's on track for that. So, Great. so thank you for taking that initiative. Um, appreciate that. Anything else on that subject at all? I guess, I guess we'll have to wait, Dave, right? See what, see what comes in and uh, evaluate it when it happens, huh? Okay. All right, that brings us to commission business. Uh, Mr. Rosser, you have anything for us tonight? I do not. And Mr. Diarpino? Um, just want to, I guess, reassure everyone that the Architectural Review Board has been very active um, the past couple months. Uh, Joel has been one of the applicants that has gone through a couple uh, meetings with us. And I think he can attest to the fact that the information that we recommend and we share with him is good. I mean, a specific instance is we took a look at some plans that he had for Kelts Farm um, a couple meetings ago, and there were some facades that were 25 feet of blankness, no windows, nothing, no fenestration, no details, and we all commented on it, and, and I think he understood that. So as this relates to the homes on Shannon Boulevard, we would expect the same thing from the Architectural Review Board members to take a hard look at this, this is a bit of a unique situation because there is some topography and hopefully the builder will recognize that and not just slap up a three-story flat wall and hopefully work with the topography that's there. It's going to, you know, lot number one is going to be unique. So I think Clark and I will make an effort to relay some of this information to the ARB board members and highlight some things that we're really interested in. And again, you know, these, these members, you know, go through the neighborhoods, they take a look at what's out there. Um, and I believe that there's uh, another candidate that is going to be submitting an application to join the board. And I've, I've met her before. I would support her application. And I think, um, you know, the members that we have are, are really, really good. And it's going to be a real big asset. Um, Clark, if you need to add anything to that, um, he's been... He's been spearheading these meetings because I have a conflict on Wednesdays, but uh, I've been reading the, the the meeting summary minutes that he sends out, which are very helpful, and occasionally talking with um, one of the other board members that I see on a professional basis. Well, that's great. And as you, as you know from the conversation tonight, it sounds like there's no lack of work or work coming their way, huh? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, so yes, thank you, that's all. All right. Uh, Mr. McPartland? I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Mr. Kahn? Sorry, nothing from me. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Scrub, you tennis? Nothing from me. Look pretty comfortable there. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Laflamme? No, sir. Nothing there. Okay, Ms. Gold? Nothing, thank you. And Ms. Shenfield? Nope, nothing for me. Okay, and the only thing I have is just a real quick a thank you. For the planning office and the planning department, and then obviously the building inspectors catching you know the height uh, concern yes. and uh, the hard work that Laura and Clark have been doing, uh, we do appreciate that. And uh, also a shout out to uh, Ms. Fody for uh, the minutes. We know they're not easy, and it looks like we have another long meeting again tonight. So we appreciate all their hard work in the office there. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion by Mr. Khan, and it's seconded by. I second that, Mr. Khan. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Nope. Hearing no one opposed, we'll uh, adjourn the uh, January 25th meeting at, see if I can focus that in, 9.50 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for um, uh, your hard work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone.
ಅಂದ್ರೆ.